Has the proceeding started? What is the situation? No, it started at uh, four o'clock, two minutes. Hello, Professor Goldman. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon here. <laughs> I'm glad you uh, joined the inauguration. <laughs> Hello. Okay, it's uh, four o'clock. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm uh, pleased to welcome you all to this conference yeah. being organized in honor of uh, Professor Raghunathan on the occasion of his uh, 80th birthday. Of course, I do not need to tell you uh, about uh, Professor Raghunathan. You all know him as a mathematician of very high uh, repute. Uh, decorated with a variety of honors, starting from the Bhatnagar Award in uh, so, uh, the prestigious award in India, the, the TWS Prize, and then more internationally, the fellowship of the Royal Society. Uh, then again, uh, Padma Shri, Padma Bhushan, etc. Uh, in short, he's of course uh, a celebrity to whom we all, we all uh, look up for inspiration and uh, guidance. and. Uh, Today we are here to uh, celebrate his, uh, uh, on the occasion of his 80th birthday, which will be there before uh, we disperse from this conference. Now, uh, if this were uh, in the BC era, uh, we would uh, very likely have had a physical conference on, for this occasion, BC, I, uh, I mean, before Corona. Uh, in the changed circumstances, we are uh, constrained to have uh, a virtual meeting. Of course, uh, it offers its own advantages. Like for instance, we are able to assemble people from all, all around the world and so on. But on the other hand, we, we do miss some of the ambience of the older uh, version, of course. Now it was uh, uh, one fine morning that uh, on uh, Professor Jugal Verma, who was uh, now currently heads the National Center for Mathematics, uh, who's succeeding uh, Raghunathan uh, with a tap and uh, called me to discuss the possibility of uh, such a conference and suggesting uh, that I convene a scientific committee for the purpose. Then uh, following the discussions, we got to uh, got the three institutions to with, with which uh, Professor Raghunathan has been associated over his career. There's the National Center for Mathematics, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and uh, the latest being the Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences of the uh, University of Mumbai and uh, the Department of Atomic Energy. Now, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a reflection on his uh, uh, energy, which all, many of you would be familiar with, is that uh, uh, recently he has accepted uh, uh, an extension of uh, three more years. So he's going to be with uh, CBS for 
uh, uh, three more years. So uh, it, it's, it's something that uh, is also worth celebrating. Now, a scientific committee was uh, constituted consisting of uh, eminent people like uh, uh, Margolis, uh, Alex Lubotsky, Andre Rapenchuk, uh, then uh, our former colleague uh, Parimala, then recent colleagues from uh, the Tata Institute, uh, Venkat Ramana, Rajan, CS uh, Rajan, and myself. Now, as there is no model or pattern that has yet set for uh, these kind of uh, video con uh, virtual conferences, we, we sort of uh, had elaborate uh, debates on how, how to go about it. Uh, one school of thought that you cannot really have uh, uh, virtual meetings of long durations. It not, it's not something sustainable and all. So finally, we arrived at something which uh, we felt everybody felt is uh, is a good model, and they, then here we are. Uh, then uh, <coughs> with, the, with the present format, then we also. Uh, uh, I arrived at a slate of invited speakers, which is more or less we adhered to, except for some small changes we had to, which had to be made because of various external factors. So, and then we also formed the organizing committee, the technical committee, etc. That is, because the organizing committee is something of a very traditional thing. The technical committee is is a late. Uh, is the addition of a later uh, variety, which uh, is, a, is also a need, and uh, the uh, for the new setting. See, uh, committees have uh, worked hard to see uh, this day and uh, to bring bring us all together. Uh, another key feature of our time, as you all know, is uh, the websites, the communication to with a wider on a wider scale through websites. And uh, all of you uh, would, of course, uh, be, have some familiarity with uh, uh, the uh, conference at website that we have. Uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, much of the registration was through the uh, websites, etc. But uh, I'll now uh, request uh, Professor Gorpade to acquaint you better with uh, what we have to offer on the uh, through the website, and also he'll say a few things about the resources that we used, etc. Uh, I over to Professor Gorpade. Uh, thank you, Professor Dani. Uh, uh, let me try to share the screen, uh, and then uh, just uh, point out a few things about the website. Uh, can, um, so can you can you see the can you see the website on your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, as websites go, this is a fairly standard uh, and simple website. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you have the name of the conference and Professor Raghunathan pointing you to that conference. Uh, what I uh, uh, want to uh, just emphasize is that. Uh, we have slightly modified uh, the website in the last uh, few days. Uh, in particular, we now have this link, which uh, gives you updated schedule of talks. And this will be the place. Uh, so maybe uh, one can click on this, and you would uh, you see the see the latest schedule. Uh, I'm sorry, my I just change my network. Sorry, uh, let me try it again. Yeah. <coughs> so here you are, here is the conference schedule. Uh, and of course, everything is online. So very, uh, in a short while from now, we will have the first mathematical session, which will be chaired by Professor Dani, as you can see here. Uh, uh, we are right now into inauguration. And uh, there is one change which you can uh, notice, uh, which is marked in red. Uh, Professor uh, Goldman uh, replaces uh, uh, somebody who was scheduled here earlier. I will uh, I will mention that. Uh, and uh, so that that is marked in red. And uh, uh, the slot where Professor Goldman was supposed to speak earlier is now marked free. And another uh, change which perhaps was. Uh, not indicated on the earlier version of the schedule is that uh, on Wednesday evening, 
we will have a valedictory meet and a felicitation for Professor Agunathan uh, after a short break after the last lecture. So the last lecture ends at 8.20 and I expect this will happen around 8.30 or so. So Danny can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, of course, uh, on this page, uh, on the next page, you also have the uh, titles of talks. But uh, if you need to know uh, more about the contents, uh, you can, of course, click on the link for titles and abstracts of talks. Uh, we have, of course, uh, shared this Zoom link with everybody who registered and uh, um, just uh, uh, more or less everybody who has registered. But uh, uh, and those Zoom links are not available on the website. They are mailed to you individually. What is available on the website, as you can see here, are the YouTube live links, uh, and there are separate ones for each day. Uh, so you can, uh, you can, anybody can go to these links and can participate, uh, uh, you know, or sort of follow the lectures. Uh, and I believe uh, this might be accessible even after the talk. I'm not so sure, but certainly during the uh, conference, you can you can see this. And yes, uh, it will be available. Yeah. yeah. So thanks, Omeya. So, so the YouTube live links will continue to be available. So if you could, you know, I think uh, we, are, we have people from different parts of the world. If you miss a lecture or you want to go back to some lecture, you can, you can use those YouTube live links. Uh, furthermore, uh, we, will, uh, uh, we have uh, requested the speakers to send to us the slides of their talk and requested permission to have the videos on. Uh, when we receive them and when we have the permission to upload, we will We'll put uh, something next to the speaker's name in square brackets uh, and give a link to the slides and video if and when they are available. So you expect that to happen. Another thing uh, I, uh, I would like to point out is uh, uh, we have, uh, you know, this is a felicitation uh, and celebration of uh, Professor Raghunathan's mathematical career. And uh, we thought it was a good idea to have uh, readily available some nice articles which are already published uh, on Professor Raghunathan. Uh, so there is an article by Professor Borel on the work of uh, Raghunathan, which you can uh, easily find at the link here. Professor Dani wrote uh, on the occasion when Professor Raghunathan got his FRS. Uh, uh, That's a very nice article you can see here. And uh, many of you would know that the International Congress of Mathematicians happened for the first and as present the only time in India in 2010. And, uh, uh, Professor Raghunathan uh, was uh, one of the main persons responsible and Rajat Tandon has written about this and you can find the story of ICM here. There is also an interview with Professor Raghunathan uh, whose YouTube link you can find here. Uh, in a short while from now, a souvenir for the conference would be released and I expect uh, you, will, you will have it available on this web page uh, somewhere before the, the committees and so on. Uh, so uh, I think... Uh, uh, that's just about it. Uh, of course, there is a list of uh, scientific committees and so on, which uh, Professor Dani mentioned. Uh, I think uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. If not, uh, I, I can stop sharing and uh, I can again hand over back to Professor Dani for further proceedings. Professor Dani, have I missed anything that I should uh, emphasize or? Hello? Dani, you are muted. Ah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that was a good introduction, and I don't see any questions uh, coming up. Sharing. So, the way we can treat it as uh, we have uh, covered that. Uh, according to the plan, we had uh, we are going to have a, a, photo, a group photo at this stage. Can the technical team tell me that? Uh, uh, how it's going to be uh, done. Sir, you want it to be uh, happening now or after the session? Yeah, when exactly uh, you want? According to the schedule that was circulated, it's to, to happen now. Would you, you want to prefer it later? Then I it's okay. It. No, uh, no uh, it can be done now. I mean, if okay, everyone yeah, is so, opening their uh, videos. Yeah. So, uh, so all of all of us uh, should be open the video, right? Yes, sir. It's my yeah, job. Please. Yeah, please open your videos. You too, Somia. They're done? Yeah. 
Ragunathan is uh, no, uh, on, video, on video. Some of the people are not opening. It's okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to take uh, some screenshots. Should I take now? Oh, yeah. some people are still opening up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Maybe a few more. Professor Raghunathan's video is not on, I think. The, oh, main, uh, the main figure. Hmm? Yeah, all right. Thank you. Yeah, hello. Uh, let's get back. <coughs> now, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, the, uh, I recall that it's a uh, conference is uh, organized jointly to, by uh, the, the three institutions and uh, uh, including the uh, uh, Raghunathan's current affiliation, the Center for uh, Excellence in Basic Sciences. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jain, who is here with us with, uh, at our invitation. And uh, uh, he's going to uh, uh, perform a pleasant duty for us, which is uh, also something I'll uh, be telling you shortly. So uh, when the uh, <coughs> uh, idea came up and uh, ha had a meeting with him. He was no not only very enthusiastic about it, but he also emphasized that you should have bring out a uh, souvenir for, on, on the occasion with uh, <coughs> uh, the abstracts as well as uh, reminiscences of various people uh, on, uh, on Raghunathan. And uh, that served as a very major motivation for actually pursuing the task and uh, so souvenir has indeed been uh, brought out, uh, which was as it was as was alluded to by uh, uh, Professor Gorpade. And uh, uh, let me mention that Dr. Jain is, is a chemist and he had a full career at uh, BRC and is currently heading us, uh, leading the Center for Excellence in uh, basic sciences. Uh, Dr. Jain, could you uh, please come up and have your video on and come up? Yeah. Yeah, all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, just one second. So uh, I, I'd like to uh, uh, take this opportunity to request uh, Dr. Jain to release the uh, <coughs> uh, souvenir that has been brought, up, uh, brought out on the occasion of this uh, conference and uh, say a few words uh, the appropriate for the, for the occasion. So uh, over to Dr. Jain. Thank you, Professor uh, Dani. It's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. It's a pleasure to see a lot of renowned mathematicians from all over the world. I now will do how to do it. Huh? Share, share. The screen share and then this video this okay share yeah is here uh this is the souvenir uh, professor ragunathan and all these people conference you can see is the uh, reverse of the back page have we have the poster yeah, you can see this, and uh, these are the abstract and all those things. It's really done uh, wonderfully. Uh, so in here, you see. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, also, Dr. Jain, I request you to address yeah. the gathering on this occasion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Dani. Uh, it is indeed an honor for me to be part of this event organized to 
felicitate one of the legendary mathematician of post independent india professor madhuvashi santanam raghunathan on his 80th birthday it is indeed gratifying that professor dani and all the team members have taken such an initiative to facilitate uh, him uh, on his birthday in my opinion what could be a better way than organizing a international conference to pay our tribute to the contributions of an eminent mathematician in the areas of geometry lie groups and algebraic groups professor nathan's work on congruence subgroup problem has made a far reaching impact on mathematics community all over the world one of his conjectures made in mid 1970s now known as raghunathan conjecture has a great influence on dynamics of class flow uh, and their applications professor raghunathan's journey from tfr that time known as bachcha to an international dada of mathematics has really inspired and motivated innumerable student of mathematics all over the world he always believed in depth and thorough on analysis of a scientific problem rather than propagating and supplementing ideas a day after tomorrow we will be celebrating his 80th birthday on this occasion i take this opportunity on behalf of each and every member of cvs family and my own to wish him a very healthy life in the current context so that he keeps us enriching with his wisdom and knowledge and with this i wish the conference very uh, every success and thank you very much uh, over to professor dani please thank you right uh, thank you dr jain uh to uh, proceed with the uh, pro program i now uh, uh, request our uh, uh, technical committee members soumya and kirti to uh, uh, to make uh, the various announcements that they would like to make i mean that this uh, medium uh, is something new to us and there are always things that uh, one needs to keep in mind etc and uh, for that reason we thought it would be appropriate that uh, uh, the technical people uh, tell us a few things about uh, uh, how uh, the i mean the uh, basic aspects of the uh, uh, zoom platform and uh, some of the uh, for instance let's say uh, mannerisms and etiquettes that should sort of show should go with it so i'll uh, invite uh, 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 dr somya yeah. and yeah. Uh, kriti to yeah okay so yeah thank you sir so uh, i guess uh, uh, almost everyone is very much acquainted with the uh, features available in zoom uh, so let me quickly go through some guidelines which uh, uh, we want all the participants to you know follow so the first point that i want to make is please keep your audio muted and video off uh, during the talks so why we want the videos to be off is like uh, it will it will consume some good amount of bandwidth and some people do not have that much uh, internet speed so keeping our videos off will uh, uh, help them to you know have a pleasant experience the second point is uh, please ensure that your actual name is displayed on zoom all right some of the names are not exactly uh, the actual names uh, so please uh, rename yourself you can uh, rename your uh, uh, name in the zoom uh, uh, please do that if if required uh, please type your questions for the speaker in the chat box in zoom please do not unmute and ask questions while uh, talk is going on you can write down your questions in the in the 
chat box uh, available in zoom the chair of the session may convey some of the questions to the speaker during the q and a session after the talk depending on of course the availability of time the next point uh, is please use the chat box only for questions or comments related to the ongoing talk okay as much as possible if you want to speak uh, to the speaker uh, during the q and a session uh, please click on raise hand in zoom okay there is an option called raise hand you click on that and then the chairperson of the session may allow you to unmute and speak so this is uh, for the zoom participants and for the participants who are uh, watching this on youtube uh, uh, please type your questions for the speaker in the chat box available in youtube live some member of the technical committee will convey the questions to the chair of the session and the chair will uh, convey it to the speaker in the q and a session and also uh, please use the chat box only for questions or comments related to the ongoing talk yeah thanks for your cooperation thank you anything more no that's it thank you okay uh, these guidelines will they be um, uploaded on the uh, web page is there a plan to uh, upload yeah those? we can we can do that yeah ah, that that will be convenient so i'll uh, let's make a, a couple of observations they uh, i suppose the uh, souvenir would probably have been uh, uploaded by now so the people uh, yes uh, well, uh, soon after we break the participants can take a look at it by uh, on their uh, laptops yes, secondly maybe uh, if, if this is not yet uh, uploaded but uh, it will soon uploaded so uh, even if uh, it might have been a quick presentation uh and though of course uh, many of the things may, may be familiar but nevertheless it may be uh, good to go over the uh, guidelines once again uh for for uh, to to keep uh, to let uh, uh, the proceedings go uh, uh, smoothly uh, through the three days of the, of the conference so at this point uh, let me th thank uh, dr jain for uh, sparing his time for this inauguration and join, joining us here and uh, uh, making, uh, saying a few uh, inspiring uh, words for us. I'd also like to thank Professor Gorpade and uh, Soumya and uh, Soumya and Kriti team. Uh, Kriti didn't appear on the screen, so we may not know her, uh, <coughs> for, for the uh, uh, presentation. And uh, 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 th thank you all. I, I especially noticed that Professor Goldman, one of the speakers who is actually going to give a talk tomorrow, has uh, taken time to uh, be uh, with us at the inauguration, which is very, which is very nice of him, uh, very encouraging for us. And uh, finally, uh, let me uh, thank you all for uh, being here for the inauguration. So we'll uh, follow the schedule. Uh, after this, and so the first talk will uh, commence at uh, uh, at four forty. That is sixteen hours forty minutes from from, from the international uh, twenty four hours uh, scale. So uh, with this, we will uh, close this inaugural uh, event uh, for the uh, conference, and uh, I look forward to meeting you. At most of you, at least, for the uh, in, in the in in the lectures that are to come during the three, day, I mean, starting from uh, after ten minutes, uh, going on, we will have uh, in all, uh, where we now are going to have uh, sixteen talks, five talks today, uh, five uh, six tomorrow, and then uh, another five on the last day. And that will again be followed by, as was already mentioned, by the uh, uh, the valedictory function. Well, will have a dual purpose. There'll be a felicitation of uh, Professor Raghunathan. Uh, there are certain uh, certain individuals whom I have invited individually to say a few words. But apart from that, they will provide some occasion to uh, uh, at least a few of the participants to uh, reminisce on. Uh, 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 the, their, uh, about on uh, Raghunathan as a part of the felicitation. 
uh, would of course like to keep it not too extended because it's uh, it's still going to follow soon after the sessions which are and uh, many people including uh, the uh, uh, master of ceremony professor agunathan himself may be, may may have uh, limitations of attending a, an extended session so uh, on the one hand we'll uh, uh, want to be uh, <coughs> comprehensive on the other hand we'd also like to be brief as far as possible i mean, I mean uh, to follow a limited uh, schedule as far as possible and so with this uh, uh, with these announcements i'll uh, uh, take leave of you we'll, we'll close uh, this session and reopen we we'll reassemble after 10 minutes so uh, thank you all uh, once again see you thank you Uh, we we can have the uh, link on uh, except that uh, sorry sir no uh, i suppose we'll have the link on right yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah right so though cuz it will be silent uh, it will be there and if there are any chats etc they can people can uh, contribute there is no no issue about that We'll be back at uh, four forty. The souvenir is available on the website. It's, it's already uploaded. I wrote it in the chat box. Yeah. Professor Dani, if you are saying something, you are muted. Uh,
Hello, Dr. Zaleski. Hello, Sharif. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Same. Good to see you. <laughs> so it's sixteen uh, forty. Welcome back. Welcome to this. Uh, first session in the uh, conference on discrete groups geometry and arithmetic in honor of professor ragunathan <coughs> uh, we have uh, two talks in this session the remaining uh, and then we will have the second session uh, during the day the first speaker is uh, shahar moses from uh, hebrew university jerusalem uh, he is uh, happens to be one of the collaborators of uh, Raghunathan, and uh, in, <coughs> also uh, he has had connections with India. He has worked with uh, uh, Nimisha, and also have, we have had uh, frequent contacts and so on. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Shahar. You. And uh, Shahar is going to speak to us today on uh, surface groups in some. Uniform lattices. The full title involves also the lattices in semi-simple uh, groups, etc. So, but he seems to have put it down for the, to to make it uh, concise. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, declared to be a joint work with uh, Jeremy Khan and uh, Francois Labour. So, over to Shahar. For uh, you have thirty minutes for uh, the presentation. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so first, let me congratulate Raghunathan for his birthday. Let's say uh, I owe a lot to Raghunathan and his mathematics and his vast knowledge and generosity with his knowledge. I've been, as Danny has mentioned, I've been very fortunate to even collaborate with Raghunathan, but his influence in me is, goes 
before we met and of course afterwards. So I don't think in 30 minutes would be suffice to say how much he influenced me and how much I owe him. And I also would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. I hope that the next Kogunatan conference will be held in India and not via Zoom. I mean, that's one thing. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can't, uh, you know, the Zoom is, doesn't have enough bandwidth to, to transmit Ragunathan or India. Definitely not both of them. Okay, so let's say, uh, so another, so just uh, one thing that, you know, since it's only 30 minutes, it's, I, I wrote down the, the notes before and I'm, I think it's the second time in my life that I give a talk that I wrote down beforehand. That's the first previous one was the ICM. I'm not sure I've ever done it before. And I think it would be obvious that not in the positive way that I've not done it before many times. So as I mentioned, so this is a joint work with Jeremy Kahn and Francois Labouy. And what, let, let me actually start with a theorem, which is uh, due to Kahn and Malkovich, which is the motivation for our work. In many ways, what you, all we are doing is extending their work and some of their ideas, producing hopefully some new ones to a more general setting. But Kahn and Malkovich, Theorem, several theorem for 2012, said that if you have a uniform lattice in PSL2C, so SO31 if you prefer, and you take a, some, then you can find a subgroup in it, which is a isomorphic to a surface subgroup. And actually they even give a quantitative version. So given some positive epsilon, then you can find some gamma G inside gamma, some subgroup, which is isomorphic to the fundamental group of a surface of a genus G, so some hyperbolic surface. And actually, this is a, this surface subgroup is actually quasi Fuchsian, meaning that you can you know you, you can take a map from the boundary of gamma G, which is just a projective line, into the boundary of the symmetric space CP1, and which is gamma G equivariant, and the image of the boundary is one plus epsilon quasi symmetric. And, and this is really a wonderful theorem. It has lots of important applications, just to mention yeah. people. People may have seen it in the context of Agon's work and proof of the Haken conjecture. But what, we, what I want to report about is the generalization of this for higher rank case, where you have now a G, a complex simple Lie group. So that's the first version of, state of the theorem. And we have again a uniform lattice. Then the claim is that you can find a surface subgroup in it. You can find the subgroup of this lattice, which is isomorphic to the fundamental group of a surface of a higher genus. And now the, this complex simple Lie group, uh, of course, they're not all groups. And let me just say, a priori, you know, we don't know how to prove it to SLN up. So that's the embarrassing thing. And on the other hand, it, it holds in more general context than the just simple, complex simple Lie groups. I'll, Maybe I'll be able to state exactly the or approximately the, the statement, the condition we need. And another thing, so, so here we can just think about SLNC. And I actually prove a quantitative statement similar to what Khan Malkovich did. And I'll just say very briefly here the quantitative version, I'll come back to it. And so we will need throughout this work, we need to fix some representation of SL2R into G, and there's some conditions on this representation. We not, would like it to have a compact centralizer, and we'd like it to, you, to associate with it, you have a flag manifold, which is just G modulus some parabolic subgroup, on which every element of SL2R under this representation acts with a unique attracting fixed point. And then once you have such a representation, then there's what we call circles, so circle just map from the projective line, the boundary, if you want, of the hyperbolic space, on which of course SL2R acts, into this flag manifold, which are equivalent under a representation of SL2R, which is conjugate to the fixed one, the one which shows at the beginning. And then if you take any triple of points on the circle, they determine symmetric on this flag manifold, right? You take the three points on the, on the circle, they, the circle, Correspond to some hyperbolic space embedding in the symmetric space. If you have three point it turns a point in the symmetric space, it gives you a visual metric on the boundary. So this gives you this metric. And then there is a notion which is called what's called Sullivan map, which is should we want to somehow to be remember in the kind Markovich, there was this quasi-symmetric maps of the boundary to the of the hyperbolic plane to the boundary of the 
three-dimensional dualic space, here we'll have what we call Zeta Sullivan maps. So this is a, a maps from the projective line into this flag manifold. So if you take any three points in the projective line, then you can find the circle. So this is a circle, remember, we call it just this type of map, which I'll give out under this summary presentation. And so that you take any three points on, on the projector and you have a circle so that the map, your map is very close to this map of the circle. Okay, so it's close up to Zeta. This is, notice these are just compact set, the circle is compact set. So this makes sense only if Zeta is small. Okay, if Zeta is loud, there's no condition. So I can condition, if Zeta is zero, this is just a circle, just zero Sullivan maps. And the main thing is that the, this will show that we'll construct, we'll construct a subgroup, a surface sub, we'll construct homomorphism from a surface sub, from a surface group into our lattice. We'd like to show this injective. And the way we show it injective, we show that associated fit will have some uh, Zeta Sullivan map, which is for Zeta small enough. And these Zeta Sullivan maps, uh, don't, I won't even read the whole statement here, come back to it later if we'll have time. It's saying that if you have a map which is Zeta Sullivan, then it's Corresponding to representation, it's called a Nostra representation. These are certain types of representation of SL to R and to G, which we we'll introduced and studied a lot by Fasalo Borifers, and then by other people. And the main, all we need to do, know about them, they are faithful. Okay, so well, as I said, there's a quantitative version. And given the time, I think it's better to skip it right now. I'll, I'll come, if there is time at the end, I'll come back to this one. So, what's the idea? How are we are going to find the surface subgroup? So, okay, so we need to look at the, they just look at the surface. We want to see with them geometrically at the surface and to see how we can start with the surface, the composing into simpler pieces, and then actually go back and find some kind of analog of these simple pieces inside our lattice and construct from them a surface subgroup or homomorphism from surface subgroup, subgroup into the lattice. So if you think about the surface, so this is just some two-dimensional manifold of higher genus and you can cut it into what's called pair of pants. So pair of pants are here. Yeah, here almost filled with pair of pants. So typologically, just some you have some surface with three boundary connected surface with three boundary con components which are homeomorphic to a circle. Okay, so these are pair of pants, and it's easy to see that starting with any compact surface, you can cut it into finite pieces, which each of one of them is a pair of pants. I don't this is just, you know, just the topological surface. This, the word hyperbolic here is not really relevant. We'll see where it plays later in the world. And so what we would like to do, we, naively, the, the ideal thing would be to try to look at the symmetric space. So X will be the symmetric space of our group. So G, G mod K, if you look at SLNC, it's SLNC modulo S U N C, And we want to look at this symmetric space and find in it many pair of pants. So things which are look like hyperbolic pair of pants. And, and you actually want to find them not in the symmetric space, but in the symmetric space modulo gamma in the, in, the, in the symmetric manifold that you get when you divide by gamma. And then you want to glue this pair of pants to construct sigma. So to go in the opposite direction, construct this uh, type of surface. Okay, so we want to find lots of pair of pants and then to glue them together to construct a complex surface of higher genus. And then you want to show that this uh, fundamental group of this surface that we construct actually injects and embeds inside gamma. Well, of course, you could take just some, you know, some ball in our X mod gamma and just construct a surface in there, but it will be contracted. Right? So, so we need to do it in a way which it injects. And this is a neat idea, but somehow we have to work with a, the, the semantic space is somewhat too complicated. It has too much, well, it, has, it has a very rich, structure and it's convenient to work with a more with coarser objects with less structure. And something this makes it harder to explain and to write, but let me try. So we're going to look at different geometric space and we replace pair of pants by some coarser objects. So it will be quasi pair of pants, I'll explain them in a, shortly. And then we're going to take this pair of pants and not exactly glue them together because they're, well, first thing they'll not be exactly a pair of pants, but we'll approximately glue them together. So what is a, so let's look again more closely, what is a pair of pants? So I said the pair of pants was a just a, topologically it's just a, something which is look like a disc in the plane which you remove two 
to, to smaller base from it. And we can draw on it. You, can, you want to triangulate it. You want to cut it into two triangles, but actually two ideal triangles. So here you, you take this pair of pants and you draw on it. Okay, so you take, take suppose you, you think of that you, what you, you do, you take and draw a curve, it's took actually three curves, one curve with spirals around one of this hole and in one direction, that direction go around this hole. And then you have this blue curve, which starts at this, around this hole and goes out and spiral around the, this boundary component, etc. So you have three, these three curves. And then if you, you know, cut along them and I color them, they, comp they, 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 they compose this pair of pants into two connected components. So here I, you know, painted them with different colors, so it's easier to follow them. And then you see that actually what you get are two ideal triangles, right? So just think of them in the hyperbolic plane, you have ideal triangles, so just triangles, the, end, the vertices at infinity. And so, so actually you can construct a pair of pants, a hyperbolic pair of pants by taking two ideal triangles and glue them together. Now, there are many ways of gluing a hyperbolic ideal triangles together. And the way we would like to do it is to, will give us a special type of pair of pants. We don't want to look at all pair of pants. We restrict ourselves to a special shape of pair of pants. So what we do, if you look at the ideal triangle, so these triangles are, should be hyperbolic triangles. You can think, take the, if you want, there are three, you can put them on the edges. You can mark special points if you want. Uh, I took a point, just a set of mass and look at the closest points of them. You can take a point perpendicular, going from one ideal point of the boundary, go per, take it perpendicular to the other edge, no matter how you do it. And then I want to glue the two triangles so that they are shielded with respect to one another by distance R. So we are going to fix some distance R and glue this triangle together when they are shear distance R. So this actually will, and, and you do it along the three edges, match them correctly. So actually, if you take these two triangles, see here, there's a blue triangle, there's another one, and you shear them distance R, R is going to be very large and you glue them, then you'll get a pair of pants and actually this pair of pants looks more like this. Okay, so it's a very narrow pair of pants. Okay, so this is with the hyperbolic structure. And so we're going to look at pair of pants and we try to build our surface for pair of pants, all of whose boundary components have lengths 2R. Okay, and we are trying to construct them. Now, uh, now this, I said that if I was continuing to work with the symmetric space, I could continue now, but now we, that's not exactly what we'll do. We have to work with a different space, which we'll call the space of tripods for some reason. I'm not sure it's a good name, but you think of it the following way. You, you think of it that you take, S, you take our group G. So G will be S, L, and C, but you fix a copy of it, G0, the S, L, and C, and S, L, N of a n-dimensional linear space of the C, and you look at all the map from, a specific copy of, SL, of G, so call it G0 to G. So the space of all this map is, is what we'll call space of tripods. Or actually tripods will be just one connected component of this, of this space. And let me skip a little and yeah. So we are going to look, at, we are going to fix a Lie algebra, SL2R inside SL, uh, uh, Inside, inside SL and C. So look at the Lie algebra SL2R, they have the, you know, there's the standard basis, A, X, and Y. So it's usually the standard basis, you can take A to be just one, the diagonal matrix is one minus one, and then you have zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero. And any representation of SL2R in the Lie algebra of G is corresponding to what's called SL2R triple, right? So these are three elements in the Lie algebra. So they have the same, satisfy the same, this relation that A, X is two X, commutator of x and y is a, and a commutator of y is minus 2y. And you're going to need some assumption. The assumption that the, the Lie algebra, or if you want to correspond to Lie group, is a compact centralizer. The element a, the same simple element, it's M, is a regular element. And there is something, some technical condition we call the flip, which, okay, there, it's written here, technically, but what you should think of it, you take the diagonal element corresponding to a, look at it, Okay, look, at, it has a lot, we wanted to have a large, a large centralizer. So if you, you, you can, there is an automorphism of the Lie algebra, which fix A in uh, place and takes X to minus X and Y to minus Y. You want to be able to realize this automorphism by rotating by an element, which 
commutes with A. Okay, this is written more technically here in the papers. Sorry. Okay, so as I said, the space we are going to work with, with is the space of tripod. So this is a replace for us the symmetric space. It's just a space of all map from a copy G0 isomorphic to G into, into G. Okay, so a tripod just as a morphism from G0 to G, and we fix one such tripod and look at only, we are only going to use the, con the conjugate of this fixed tripod. That's the space we are going to work with. And we fix also an SL2 R triple in the Lie algebra of our fixed copy of, of G of SLNC, this G0. So this once you fix this, this gives you a map from a hyperbolic plane into the symmetric space of this G0, and you have this map from the boundary, and you have a three specific points in the boundary, zero, one, and infinity, which are associated with the standard basis of the fix of SL2R. Okay. Yeah. And so given a choice of this G algebra, this SL2R, the, every typod, every isomorphism from G0 to G, fix, gives us a map from the boundary from the projective line into this flag manifold, and you have this three point going to a specific three point to some three points on the on the boundary. And three points on the boundary, they give you a triangle, right? What we call think of an ideal triangle. So we just schematically we draw them like this triangle. We have these three points at the boundary in the flag manifold. These are three points at the moment which comes from from which sit on a circle map on a map from the projective line conjugate to G mod P, which is conjugate to our presentation. And we'll just uh, draw an arrow here to specify which is the attracting or repelling fixed point of the diagonal element. So this is called a triangle. And now we, say we, want, to, now we want to construct a pair of plans. This was done by taking two triangles, ideal triangles, including after shearing. So you have these two triangles and you Okay, you, you can define, you have an arrow going along one edge and here's this arrow, these are this arrow which appears here. And you say that they are shield if they sit next one next to the other. And if you look at this, the, the, if you take the perpendicular from this cell point to this edge and from this point to this edge, the base of the perpendicular distance are apart. Okay, and all these four points sits on this, on this unique circle. Okay, and then we also need some technical thing of rotating the, the edge. And this is just to say that what would be a perfect way of constructing a perfect pair of pants? If you take this pair of pants, there are these two triangles and you lift them, lift them up. So you take one triangle, lift it up, you get this tau zero. And then you have these three adjacent triangles, which are actually the same one. You can lift them in three ways. You get T one, tau one, tau, tau two, and tau three. And all this tau one is shear with our shear with respect to tau zero. Tau two is our shield with rotation of tau zero and the same for tau three. And when you have such an object, then you, you get actually three elements, alpha, beta, and gamma in G. So these are the elements. Alpha will be an element which takes this triangle and just, if you want to rotate it, take this triangle and map it to this triangle. Beta takes this triangle, tau one, and makes this triangle appear in here. And gamma is just take this triangle and rotate it, fixing this point, they can here. And it is to say to check that alpha time, beta time, gamma, it's just the identity. So if you have such a four triangles, this, this gives you a pair of pants with boundary of length to R, but these elements alpha, beta, and gamma that you construct are just element in G. We would like to have such an object with elements in gamma. And this is too restrictive. You can't find such elements in gamma. Probably there is no reason to be in gamma. There will be a, you know, any, any pair of pants if all three boundary components of the same length to R. So we have to allow what we call quasi tripod. So basically you, you just take the picture, the ideal picture that you described and you perturb a little. So a quasi tripod means that you take a triangle, a tripod, which is a really three point sitting on a circle, a circle with this particular type of map from the, from the projective line of the flag manifold, but you take points which are near them. You allow kind of wiggling a little. You take three points which are near these three special points. So that would be quasi tripod and and this gives you enough freedom to try and construct this uh, pair of pants. Now, the way you construct pair of pants is very much like you want to, if you look at a say, hyperbolic manifold and you want to construct a closed geodesic. So going back to Margulis thesis, we know how to do it by taking you know, a long geodesic 
and let it flow for a long time, then use mixing, you know that you come after takes you should not use the mix you know that once you flow long enough time you'll be, be able to find to come back very close to where you started and then there is a closing lemma i mean you can start you can shift a little starting point and then it affects the ending points of the day collide so there is a mixing plus closing lemma imitating Margulis thesis is what allows us to do it and but now we need not to take just close your desert but to kind of you want a close pair of pines okay so we use mixing and closing lemma to uh, some of multiple mixes actually in some sense to 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 get this uh, to get to, to construct a pair of pants and actually this not exactly pair of pants they're epsilon over our, our stitch meaning that you know the boundary lengths are all are more or less to r up to some epsilon and also the pair of pants are not exactly glued together there is some epsilon of our perturbation now, so each pair of pants you, which you construct is associated with three elements in the, in the lattice gamma. Lattice, the lattice gamma is fixed. So now we have lots of, we actually construct using this mixing and closing lemma, lots of pair of pants. All of them, for, we choose some, some R, large R, which you have to choose some of, there was in background, there was this Sullivan map, which I skimmed over. This allows how to choose this epsilon and you find, Lots of uh, pair of pants, all of those boundaries are of lengths roughly two R, and each one of the boundaries corresponds to some elements. To an element, so each pair of pants, you get three elements, alpha, beta, and gamma, and gamma. All of them are hyperbolic elements, which roughly translate distance to R. And they have this condition that alpha time, beta time, gamma is the identity. And this is really an equality. This is not approximate. This is really the identity. This is important. So we show that you have lots of them, and then you want to use them to somehow construct a hyperbolic surface. So, so let's think what we're trying to do. We, hyperbolic surface, so here you see a hyperbolic surface, and which is partitioned into pair of, lots of pair of pants, some finite number of pair of pants. So we want to take a, if you want to think of it, that you start with a hyperbolic surface, partition to finitely many pair of pants, and each pair of pants, PI, you want to, a map which associate to this PI, some quasi pair, quasi epsilon R of uh, R stitch pair of pants, this approximate, Pair of pants that we constructed in such a way that if you have two pair of pants here, PI and PJ, let me enlarge it. So you have this PI and PJ are two pair of pants here which are adjacent along some boundary, then this quasi pair of pants which they correspond to, this QI and QJ, they'll have each one of them has three boundary components, each one of the, so you have still six elements from the lattice, but you want this along this adjacent, they'll have the same common alpha, the same element from the lattice gamma. And Suppose you, so that's, so what, if you find such a collection, some surface and a collection of partition of it into pair of pants, so that any pair of pants in the surface correspond to this quasi pair of, pair of pants or stitch pair of pants that we constructed in such a way that adjacent thing have the boundary elements being the same, this immediately gives you a homomorphism. If you look at it, you, can, you get from this a homomorphism for the fundamental group of this surface into your lattice gamma. Just map every boundary of this pair of pants here to the corresponding element in, in gamma. Now, this would be a homomorphism, but it's not clear why. Well, first thing we have to show that such a thing can be found, but also it's not clear whether it will be injected, right? It's maybe you just took you know, one pair of pants and somehow maybe you fold it back and you just put something which is contractible. So you have to glue them in a in a way which is a allows you to control things. And the idea is the following, that maybe I'll, I'll write here. So, so we have a, we have lots of pair of pants in, sitting inside our space. So think of just now as a symmetric space. And let's just, let us assume right now that we are really take, working not with quasi pair of pants, but really with pair of pants, ideal one, perfect one. And so you want to somehow, when you'll be able to glue two things, you want to, to, to glue them uh, here, if you look at the pair of pants, here's an ideal pair of pants. Uh, you want to glue here another pair of pants. So it has to go, maybe I'll change the color. You want to glue here some pair of pants. So the boundary has to, to match. And notice that if you have this pair of pants and look at it, you can, find, you can draw on it 
arrows in the middle of each of the, on each boundary component, you can put an arrow, actually two points, there are two special points you can put an arrow pointed to the center of mass if you want of these ideal triangles. And you want to glue, to glue two pair of pants if this arrow are going to be, to be what we'll call a Kahn-Markovic twist of one another. You want to glue them if these arrows are, well, they want to point in the opposite direction and to be shifted with distance one. That's the shift of distance one is something, this is an idea which goes back to the work of Kahn and Markovic. It's a beautiful idea that you have to shift by distance one. It's really an insight. And this is a, I want to emphasize it. It's due to, the, to them, not to us. And it's really a very nice observation because what would be the problem? If you, I mean, ideally you want to glue them with this, these two arrows, this arrow and this arrow will, will be just the, maybe even one next to the other, but really one the minus of the other. But you can't do it. You have to allow some perturbation. And if you do this perturbation along an, a narrow path, then you could, they can accumulate and sink and collapse. The point is by- Shahar? Yeah, I have- Shahar? No. Yes. Okay. I, I yeah, think please I have, go ahead. You, you have another uh, few minutes. Yeah, if I, I, if I look correctly, I think I have another three or four minutes, I think. Now it is two more minutes officially, but okay, you can- two Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying that you want to glue them this way. Now there is one, okay, so let me just say, okay, so, so you want to, to allow things to be glued if they are, these arrows are distance one from one another and pointing roughly the opposite direction. Now, why can you find such thing? Now, you, what you do is the phone. You, you, remember, we have a finite collection of, a, we fix some big, huge R. So we have a finite collection of pair of pants. Each pair of pants has a boundary. Look at the boundary which appears, the sum alpha which appears and there are pair of pants. Actually, there are going to be many of them. And the arrows are going to be, so you have this, this alpha gives you, if you think of it, you can think of it that as if it gives you some closed circle, some boundary component of length to R and on it you have arrows. And these arrows are going to be equidistributed or close to, even in the very close to being equidistributed. So in large R they're converged to the equidistribution. And then you want someone to, to make a matching. So you have a graph, you have final venue versus each, pair of pants, you look at, it, at its boundary, you look at who it can be connected to. You, you make a graph to whom it may be connected. These are the things which are distance epsilon from the kahn markovic shift of them, twist of them. And you want to show that you can find the perfect matching. And this uses the Hall's marriage lemma. So the whole marriage lemma is a, statement, is a very beautiful and simple statement about graph theory, which speaks usually about bipartite graph. And you ask, when can you have Bipartite graph, n vertices, n vertices, and adjacency relation. When can you make a perfect mesh? And of course, you need that every set here, the number of things it knows on the other side has to be at least the same size. Using this equidistribution that you get from mixing, from the mixing allows you to, to show the, that the condition of some extension of the whole marriage lemma holds. And that's how you, you make this gluing. So, whole marriage lemma gives you the gluing. And then these things are as I said, the gluing with the distance epsilon of R, and that allows you to lift thing and build a map from the boundary, which is going to be what we call Sullivan map, which is this analog, this extension of being quasi-symmetric, which allows you to sort of think inject and then think I'm out of time. So I'll just, I, I think I'll stop here since there is no more time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Shahar, for the talk. Uh, are there any questions? I see that Mahan raised the hand. I don't know how to operate this thing, but maybe if Mahan just yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So, uh, Shahar, I mean, where did you use uniform lattices? Uh, well, they use in all this. Uh, okay. First thing, let me say that uh, uniform is probably not needed because in the case of SL2C, uh, Khan and Jeremy Khan and Alex Wright already proved it in the non uniform case, just for SL2C. We, yeah. we use it in order to bound the distances. We, we have to take okay. estimate, estimate on mixing, and then there is something which we need to, but it's more, I think, uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's essential that you put this way. Okay, thanks. Thank this you. is something that I think we should be able to overcome. Mm -hmm. 
this uh, being able to rotate the flip, what we call the flip condition, which I didn't even, I just, you know, maybe just put, moved over it very fast, but just saying that uh, this automorphism can be realized by center, like that's something we don't know how to overcome. Even though in certain contexts, uh, Kahnemark, which uh, overcame it, mm-hmm. or the errant life conjecture. So it should be also, this also should be just technical. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, so your construction proceeded by manufacturing three elements, alpha, beta, gamma, with product identity in the lattice on the right-hand side. I'm just calling it right-hand. G in the S, L, and C. Yes. Uh, so which kind, kind of rose like a semi-canonical way from your pair of pants thing, right? Or am I... No, you, you can find such elements very easily, of course, but the pair of pants allow you to find such three elements, which are all, well, fun thing, they're all more or less the same shift of this is already not obvious why. It, first, you would take alpha and beta and gamma being the inverse of the product, right? But you, you yeah. want the cell one also to be roughly the same uh, distance to R. And then, you know, there is a lot of things which are hidden, which, especially about this last part, why it's injective. Then yeah. we need it that it's uh, coming from pair of pants and we need this... Uh, cheating about how to do it, not in a in correct way, this uh, vector, this, this uh, you have to be able to, uh, to assert with this element, this vector here and glue them in such a way. If I just take elements, alpha, beta, and gamma, and gamma, which satisfy this relation. Yeah, that's what my question is. Is the converse to you take any three elements, then do they arise from this pair of pens construction? No, 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 no. Okay. no. Anyone else? These are special ones. Okay, these are special ones. Thank yeah. you. Maybe I should, one, one thing I'd like to say is that Ursula Hammerstadt also have related results. I should have mentioned at the beginning. And I think Raghunathan has something to say. Yeah. yeah can I ask my question? Sure. Yeah, please, please go ahead. No. I, I tapped on Ray's raise, raise hand. It didn't work anyway. The question I have for Shahar is, uh, can one do anything about uh, higher dimensional hyperbolic manifolds, their fundamental groups? Because this is, of course, you are using very special uh, techniques for uh, the surface case. But so, for se- ah, to find the fundamental group, uh, uh, ah, not find the surface, but finding a... Hyperbolic three manifold, fundamental group oh. three manifold, for instance. Uh- I'm not sure it will be true, actually. It's, I'm not sure it will work, but I have to think. Well, you see, the, of course, uh, all lattices, except for SL3C, all lattices are going to be arithmetic. That doesn't uh, help you do something, you know, the, <clears throat> there's the complete classification after all. I have to think, I, I, I someone will be very surprised if you can always find them, but I haven't thought about it really. Okay. I have to think, but I, I think maybe Mahan will know it offhand, but I think it's be very surprising if you can. I mean, you, I, I will also be surprised if you can't really, but. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think not, and I think it should be doable. I mean, think we should, okay, let me think. Okay. This is recording, I want uh, to say a completely ridiculous thing, but I don't believe it. Will be. Okay. I think it shouldn't be hard. Also. Okay. Uh, With that, I, I thank Shahar yeah, once again for the talk. About. And also the people who asked the questions. I think the session is interesting. So uh, we'll, we'll reassemble in, our, in another five minutes for the next talk. Yeah. Professor Lubatsky uh, wants to say something. Uh, I, uh, I just. Okay. Uh, 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 Alex, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I want to say that uh, one can understand Raghunathan's question in two ways, whether some three manifold group is there, or whether every up to commensurability in SL2R there is a unique, in a sense, unique uh, co-compact lattice with up to commensurability, which is the surface group. In the in the SL2C, of course, there are many, and I think that in, 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 there is some uh, good chance that many uh, uh, 
arithmetic lattices in uh, say complex group contains a, a piece of SL2. Yeah, but there may be, but I think he asked if every, and I think, there, I think you can construct no, no, lattices question, where you don't find any. When you say every, you mean every or some? No, I, I, think, I think that, I think every contains some, and I think this, even this would not be true. You think even so this? There will be lattice will contain none. That's my guess. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, if you look at SLNR and you take uh, all the groups, uh, look at another, yeah. come, come from a division algebra of odd degree, then I don't think it will contain a surface yeah, group. So if I take a prime and you'll, you'll get this thing. This uh, prime this degree, uh, an odd prime. Then I don't think uh, you can find a like, surface group inside that. But, uh, no, well, you cannot find one which is, a, a, how you say, a totally geodesic, but, yeah, yeah. In, an, but as an abstract group, you may uh, find. I, yes, but, I don't but know. when I, you look I, at I, a higher rank, Alex, it might be the same. I'm kind of skeptical about that. I'm, I don't know, but uh, my gut instinct would be to say you won't be able to find surface groups of that kind. Maybe uh, we'll postpone this discussion and yeah, closing <laughs> time for the next talk. So, so uh, thank you, Shahar, once again. Thank you. Thank you. And again, congratulations also to Anna. Hello, Sachik. Yeah, hi. Yeah. hi. So, uh, yeah, I, I will share my iPad screen. You, you can start sharing your. Yeah, I, I don't want to share my laptop. Oh, you, you will be doing the live. Okay, so. Um. Rick. Hello, uh, it's time for the uh, sex next talk. I welcome Dr. Sachik Gelander. Uh, he's from, he's uh, our next speaker. He's from uh, the Weizmann Institute of Science at uh, Rehovo, Israel. Uh, I have not had the benefit of uh, knowing him in any detail, but uh, one thing that uh, appealed to me was that he is uh, going to talk, talk to us about a proof of uh, a conjecture of Margulis that he has uh, obtained in, in collaboration with. So uh, the, the, the title of the talk, as you see on the screen, is infinite volume and infinite injectivity radius. And it is joint work with uh, Mikolai Fratsik, I think that's, that's the principle. Mikolai. Over to Dr. Gelander. Thank you. So, uh, uh, okay, so I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, it's exciting for me to speak uh, in the conference for Gunatan. Gunatan, was one of the mathematicians who mostly influenced me from far away. Um, in the beginning of my PhD, I spent some time studying his book, which is now on the reading list of uh, all my students, the book about discrete subgroups uh, of league groups. And uh, by the way, my students prefer uh, his uh, videos on YouTube, uh, which were not available at my time. <clears throat> Uh, among the Ragunathan work that influenced me is uh, 
One thing is that his work with Garland about uh, uh, fundamental groups, a uh, fundamental domain of um, rank one lattices. Uh, of course, his uh, celebrated work on the congruent subgroup property, and also his work with uh, uh, Moses and Lubotsky. Uh, this is uh, about the geometry of high rank uh, non uniform lattices and the distortion of uh, unipotent element, which is uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, theorems about uh, the geometry of uh, lattices. Um, <clears throat> uh, and many other work of Fagunakans. Uh, so, my talk is about the title is Infinite Volume and Infinite Injectivity Radius. And it's a joint work with the uh, Miko Y Frakjik. And uh, we proved the following theorem. So I hope my internet is good. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let G be a simple Lie group. I, I will state it for simple. Uh, rather than semi-simple, maybe later on I will discuss semi-simple group. It's more convenient to assume that uh, for, for simplicity. Uh, of rank, real rank, at least two. And uh, let uh, lambda inside G be a discrete subgroup. I use lambda because usually I use gamma for lattices, and here uh, I don't want lambda to be necessarily a lattice. Uh, <clears throat> then the locally symmetric space G mod K, I take the, the same notation as Shachar, uh, mod lambda, maybe switching orders, uh, as infinite volume. If and only if uh, it has infinite injectivity radius, so uh, it admits injected contractible balls of any radius. <clears throat> yes, so th this was conjecture by uh, Margulis and. Uh, so basically, uh, you should think of a, a, a manifold of a, or orbifold of infinite volume. Uh, so it has some geometry, but if it has infinite volume, uh, then at any point uh, you can find, or, or not, not at any point, for any for any radius, you can find somewhere uh, an injected contractible uh, ball with that radius. So basically this is a result about general discrete groups and uh, mostly about non-lattices. Uh, and uh, I think by today we have, uh, there is a remarkable uh, theory about lattices, but there are not so many results about uh, general discrete groups. But this can also be um, realized as a result about lattices because it says that it's characterization of lattices. Basically, the volume is finite if and only if the injectivity radius is bounded. Um, so by the way, Margulis has a wonderful proof for the borel Chandra theorem that arithmetic groups have finite volume. Uh, and when I think about his proof, I, I think of it in, in two steps. So, so it proves like a criterion. So if you have a locally symmetric manifold, uh, and it has a property that when you go to infinity, the inject injectivity radius go to zero, then the volume must be finite. And then it shows that the arithmetic group satisfies this. So here you can say you can say you don't need the injectivity radius to go to zero. It's, just, it's enough even that it's bounded, uh, and then it implies finite volume. Uh, but this is only for higher rank. So so maybe I will write. <clears throat> An example. So let uh, G be of rank one now, like SO in one or SPN one, etc. Uh, and let gamma in G be a uniform lattice. 
uh, let lambda be a normal subgroup in gamma, uh, non-trivial of infinite index. So gamma is a hyperbolic group, gamma of hyperbolic group. So it has many normal subgroups. So you can find in particular a normal subgroup of infinite index. Uh, then the manifold uh, G mod K mod lambda has infinite volume, but bounded injectivity radius. And how, how do you see that? Consider, uh, okay, so let uh, omega be in the symmetric space, a uh, compact such that it's a fundamental domain. So if you want a gamma times omega covers, covers the symmetric space. So I assume that gamma is a uniform lattice. And then let uh, D uh, or let take some element, let alpha be an element in lambda. And uh, D be the maximum of the displacement of alpha. This is the Riemannian distance and this is how, alpha, the, how the group act over the, this compact set. So this is a finite constant. So now for every y in the symmetric space, uh, let uh, gamma in gamma be such that gamma inverse y is inside the fundamental domain. And then you see that D of gamma alpha gamma inverse, the displacement at Y of this element is the same as the displacement of alpha gamma, in, gamma inverse Y, gamma inverse Y, which, and this is in the fundamental domain. So this is at most D and this element is inside lambda because lambda is a normal subgroup. So you see that uh, you, in that way, you get a manifold of infinite volume, uh, but bounded inductivity radius. Um, <clears throat> so the theorem uh, has several applications. So in particular, it implies a, a Margulis a normal subgroup theorem that uh, if you have lattice in higher rank, then every normal subgroup is either a finite index or central, uh, but it says much more. It says things about general, not just normal, but any subgroup. Uh, and it also says things about discrete group, which are not in a lattice. But again, it is only, uh, it. Margulis proved his normal subgroup theorem in a greater generality, for instance, in SL2R times SL2R for reducible lattices. And we do not know to prove our theorem. So we need some stronger assumption, but for when this assumption applies, like for instance, if G is a product of higher rank groups, then, then uh, it implies a stronger statement. It also implies uh, the result of the seven authors um, a few years ago was a paper by Abert, uh, Bergeron, Beringer, myself, uh, Nikolov, uh, Rambald, and Summit. Uh, <clears throat> and we proved the following theorem. So, so again, let rank G be at least two. Uh, then for every V, or for every, for every R, there is V such that if the volume of the locally symmetric space G mod K mod gamma uh, is bigger than V, but finite, then uh, G mod K mod gamma contains, admits a point uh, 
a point of injectivity radius uh, at least r, at least yes. So if you have a large volume, then you have a large injectivity radius, but uh, in that work, we assumed also that the volume uh, is finite. All the method uh, were using lattices, result, theory of lattices, and now you can, uh, you, can, you can delete this assumption. So whenever the volume is, is big enough, uh, even if it's infinite, then you have large injectivity radius. And uh, the proof is uh, using random walk. So it used probabilistic method. Basically we show that, uh, we want to show that the R thick part is non empty. And we show that if you do a random walk on the locally symmetric manifold, then you will spend eventually most of the time in the R thick part. And this is true for every R. So let me uh, introduce some annotation. Uh, and we, can, we, we actually don't need to speak about um, manifold. We can all, we can discuss it all inside G, but uh, so definition uh, lambda and discrete subgroup of G is called uniformly slim. If the, the orbifold uh, G mod K mod lambda has bounded injectivity radius. So that's uniformly slim. Uh, it means, uh, okay. And, uh, and uh, the result, the theorem that uh, we proved is that uh, for higher rank simple group, to be uniformly slim is equivalent to be a lattice. Uh, now, this is equivalent to the following. So there exists C inside G compact such that C intersect every conjugate of gamma of lambda in non-trivially. And if you want, uh, lambda is not uniformly slim, if and only if there is a sequence Gn in G such that the conjugation of lambda by Gn uh, converge to the trivial group uh, with respect to the Chabuti topology, the topology of closed subgroups. So yeah, I <clears throat> topology of closed subgroup. I mean the Chabuti topology. So that's a, a, um, that's uniformly slim. And uh, <clears throat> to say something about the proof, uh, we look at uh, random walks. on the space of discrete subgroups. So there is some philosophical sentence that I like to say that in mathematics, uh, it is uh, fruitful to add randomness and, and indeed sometimes we are able to prove results about random objects which we cannot see about a deterministic object, but it seems a, uh, like a miracle sometimes when we can say something about a deterministic object by viewing them as random object. Now, uh, in the last 10 years, the theory of uh, invariant random subgroup uh, was uh, very fruitful and, and many results about asymptotic invariant of lattices was proved using the notion of invariant random subgroups. However, when you consider non-amenable group uh, to restrict yourself to invariant probability measure, it's, it's a big compromise. Um, so, so this is uh, what we did here. We, we allowed ourselves to deal with, uh, <clears throat> with a uh, more general notion, which is that of stationary random subgroup. 
and and uh, and the stationary measure is what you get by uh, looking at uh, the limit of uh, a random walk. So so let uh, uh, let uh, mu be a probability measure. On G, by the way, so so G, uh, or before that, before that, I I look at sub G. Is the Chabati space of all uh, closed subgroup of G? Uh, this is a compact space, and inside we have the subset of discrete subgroups. Which is an open subset of uh, of uh, of sub G because we discuss uh, really groups, so there are no small subgroups. So it means that uh, sub D G is open, uh, and <clears throat> and uh, G acts on this space uh, by conjugation and by random subgroup we we mean some probability measure on this space. And the invariant random subgroup is a probability measure which is invariant under the G action. And now we, I want to consider a more general notion of stationary random subgroup. So, so, uh, so mu, this measure mu is a measure on G and explicitly mu, I will take this measure. Well, uh, this is a hard measure on the maximal compact, we fix a maximal compact subgroup and the Dirac measure on S, where S is some semi-simple element, a semi-simple element, which expands a lot uh, when acting on the unipotent radical of uh, some minimal parabolic. Uh, so, so basically just example, you can take S to, for SLN to be a diagonal element as long as uh, you have big jumps, big enough jumps uh, for every I. So that's a measure we will work uh, with inside uh, G and then uh, given uh, lambda, uh, which is a discrete subgroup of G, so so it's it's a point in the space of discrete subgroup. Uh, consider the the random walk. So so we do a convolution. We start with the point at that point. So we start with the Dirac mass at that point, and then. We look at the Chazaro average and let's call this a uh, new N. So that's a probability measure uh, on the space of, uh, of discrete subgroup of G. And then the theorem that we proved The theorem by Miko Y. Fakchik and myself is that uh, uh, no, if okay uh, under the same assumption that Jesus rank one simple group, uh, this uh, new n converge to the Dirac mass of the trivial group. Now you see that uh, if you start with the element, so, so all this new n, all these measures uh, here along the way are uh, supported on the conjugacy class of lambda. So the limiting measure must be supported on the closure of the conjugacy class. And therefore, uh, by showing that it's this, it, in particular, it would mean that lambda is not uniformly slim. So again, so, so maybe I will say the theorem precisely because, uh, so the theorem says, that uh, if uh, rank G is at least two, and let's say G is simple, there is a version also when it's not simple, but uh, <clears throat> and lambda 
inside G discrete, but not a lattice. Then, uh, then we have uh, this. And <clears throat> so that's a two. And uh, let me say something about the proof. The proof has uh, three steps. Um, step one is to prove discreteness. So you see the space of uh, of discrete subgroup is open in the space of all closed subgroup, but it's not closed. So you need to show that the limit is, is discrete. So we prove the following theorem uh, that uh, if nu infinity is a limit of nu n, a weak star limit, uh, then it is supported on discrete subgroup. Nu infinity of the space of, of this open set is, uh, is one. So almost surely, if you take a random group, it will be discrete. And this result made use of a recent work uh, by a, a recent joint work uh, by uh, Ariel Levitt, uh, Margulis, uh, uh, and myself. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> what we, we actually uh, studied uh, a quantitative version of the celebrated Kashdan Margulis theorem, uh, a concrete quant quantitative version of that. Uh, this paper uh, was submitted to the special volume for Prasad uh, 75 birthday. And, uh, and, but the main result, the, the main technical result, is, uh, is the following uh, theorem uh, that uh, we proved. Uh, <laughs> there exists some constant delta, some constant C, and some constant B, such that, uh, oh, I must introduce an ocean, sorry. you want to define the discreteness function. So, so let this be a norm on the Lie algebra such that the exponent uh, uh, is, is a diffeomorphism when restricting to uh, the unit pole in the Lie algebra. Then define the discreteness function for a discrete group lambda to be the supermoon of R such that the exponent of the ball of radius R intersect lambda trivially. So that's measure how discrete is, is the group lambda. But it doesn't see large injectivity radius, only small injectivity radius. This, so that's the, 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 the weakness of this is that it only see small in, in injectivity radius. Uh, but uh, the strength of this is that you can prove for the measure I defined above that uh, for every lambda uh, in G discrete, uh, the convolution of I to the minus delta of lambda is smaller than C times I to the minus delta plus B. And basically, uh, <clears throat> if you know that, uh, then you can uh, argue like in the paper of, uh, in, uh, like in the work of Margulis and Eskin about uh, random work uh, on uh, Gmod gamma and, uh, and prove uh, theorem one. 
And so, so for, for the work here, we just need this constants, but for the work with Margulis and, and Arya Levitt, uh, we wanted the explicit constant. Here, we just needed it to be less than one. And, and there, we, we wanted something very uh, effective, depending on G. Uh, so this is step one. Step two is stiffness result. Uh, basically, uh, we prove the following theorem. A discrete a stationary random subgroup is invariant. If you want discreteness, discrete SRS, that's the new notation, implies IRS. And this result, so, so, so this limit uh, measure, it's a, it's, a, it's a limit of Cesaro average of convolution with mu, so the limit will be mu invariant, so it will be mu stationary, and, uh, and therefore it must be uh, actually invariant. Uh, that's the, the result. And this relies uh, heavily on the remarkable work of uh, 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 relies on the work of uh, remarkable work work or, or works actually because it's a series of paper uh, of uh, uh, Nevo and Zimmer. So there is so so Nevo and Zimmer extended Margulis factor theorem to to stationary action of a semi simple higher rank group and and uh, uh, we relied on that. And the, the last step uh, and the last step for our uh, uh, consideration is uh, is rigidity. And here we apply a uh, Stuck Zimmer uh, theorem. So, so in the general higher rank case, uh, when we uh, allow semi simple and not simple, there is something to prove. But here, when you deal with the uh, when you deal with the uh, in the simple case, so it once you have a an IRS which is supported on on discrete group, then you know that it's support add either on the trivial group or on lattices. Uh, so if you apply Stuck Zimmer theorem plus local rigidity, then you get that uh, if the original group was not a lattice, uh, so in the, the limit of the conjugacy class, you cannot have lattices and therefore uh, the stationary random subgroup must be supported on the trivial group. Uh, so I think, that's my time to finish, or I, I have more time. I, I'm a bit confused about the time. I, I don't hear you. Danny, you, you are muted. Yeah, uh, officially the time is finished, but you might okay. take some time to wind up if you wrap up. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll say some, I'll, I'll just write one theorem in the general uh, semi-simple group so 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 because I, I restricted to simple case so it will take half minute so so theorem in general uh, so let uh, g be a semi-simple Lie group with no compact factors uh, <clears throat> And let a, a lambda inside G discrete such that a lambda intersection with H is not a lattice in H for every H which is not trivial and normal in G, then. Uh, 
for every limit uh, of this uh, Chazao average, mu i convolution, if you do the random walk, uh, is supported on discrete subgroup of the product of rank one factor. So that's somehow a, a general result, uh, which implies some consequence in the in, in this. So we have some rigidity. You don't see the high rank factors in the limit, only rank one factor. But there could be interesting measure supported on the discrete subgroup of rank one factor. This was you can actually construct a non-invariant stationary random subgroups uh, on such on rank one groups. Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe right. question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Galanda, for the talk. Now, uh, are there any questions? Viragunathan? No. <laughs> okay. I, I just want to ask one question, which is uh, a simple question. Uh, Professor Gelander said that uh, a set of discrete subgroups is open in sub G. So that's for semi-simple group G, is that what? That, that's for every Lie group. Uh, this, is, this follows when you have uh, uh, no small subgroups. So, so there is this notion of non-small subgroups. So, so G has no small subgroup if there is an identity neighborhood which contains no non-trivial subgroup, and this is equivalent to being a Lie group, actually, by the Hilbert fifth problem. So, so yeah, so, so for every Lie group, uh, the, set of, the set of discrete subgroups is open in the space of all subgroups. You don't need semi-simple. So nothing from outside can converge to uh, discrete subgroup. That's what it means. Then. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. Any other questions? If there are no questions. Let me let's thank uh, Dr. Galando once again for the talk. On, uh, thank you. Interesting talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And with that, I think we will have. A, 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 I uh, declare the se this session closed. The second session will start within uh, half a, half an hour at uh, six six thirty. 
Well, I'm already online. So if uh, you want me to share a screen or test it, so tell me. Uh, yes, Pavel, if you can try sharing screen. Sure. Nice, to, nice to see you. Sorry. Very nice to see you too. <laughs> Let me try to do it. Share. Share. Can you see anything? Yes, I can see it. Uh, could you make it uh, full screen? Yes, like this. Yes. yes. Thank you. So how are things in India? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> managing, I think it's, it's becoming better now. But do you have classes now or uh, it is summer break? Uh, since most of the places have a break right now. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the places also have online classes. Yeah, we also have online classes in our university. Yeah, it's the break for uh, most places. What will happen in January is not clear. Probably depends on vaccination and, uh, and situation. Yes. <laughs> How is the weather there now? Well, here is is dry season. Therefore, the weather is always the same. Blue sky, no rain. <laughs> we have something like 20% of humidity only. Mm -hmm. just, let's just wait for two minutes. In India, I think also there is rain season and dry season, or it is not. That's right. It's uh, monsoon now starting. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think Bombay it rained a lot. Hi, Suri. Hello, Jyoti. Nice to see you. How are you? <laughs> fine? What's going on? <laughs> okay. How about you? I'm fine. Right now, where are you now? I'm in Ka Calcutta. Hmm. <laughs> okay. So we have to wait for the talk now. Uh, just a minute, I think. One minute. When I, when I present, I should uh, switch my video off, right? Uh, I think it can be on, I guess. We are the speaker. Most of us would have our videos off. All of us must. Uh, no, have you yeah, I because I, I asked because uh, to, to switch off, uh, off my video, I have to undo the full screen, then switch the video, and then make it again <laughs> full screen. <laughs> oh, I see. No, but I can your, do it. Hmm. Uh, I think we could have your video on. Uh, okay. See. Okay, so I guess it is uh, time now. So welcome back everybody for the second session. Uh, as a talk sort of short duration, I'll keep the introductions very short. Uh, first, uh, I would like to invite uh, Pavel Zaleski. Uh, Pavel Zaleski got his doctorate in Minsk. Since 2003, he is a full professor at the University of Brasilia. He's also elected a member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences. And you know, he's written a very highly acclaimed book with rebates on profanate groups. Uh, today, he'll speak on the congruence of group problem, the rank one case. Uh, Pavel, please go ahead. Yes, many thanks. Uh, well, as uh, Suri already mentioned, I studied in Minsk and uh, also did my uh, graduate uh, undergraduate graduate study in Minsk, as he mentioned. and. Uh, in Minsk, uh, the name of Ragunathan was uh, quite famous. It was mentioned like, uh, quite uh, frequently with great respect and admiration. And so I had this name already and as an undergraduate student. And this gave me uh, really uh, enormous pleasure to give uh, this talk 
uh, for his uh, uh, 80th birthday. And I really want to thank uh, the organizers uh, very much for giving me possibility to do this. And uh, it seems that I'm only one who speak about congruence subgroup problem here. And that's why I probably will start with the history, right? An introduction to this, all right? Uh, so, um, uh, in fact, the uh, investigation to the congruence subgroup problem began in 19th century. So how can we uh, uh, look at it, all right? So if we have a commutative ring, an ideal alpha, right? Then uh, we have natural map mod congruence uh, uh, reduction model alpha, all right? And uh, the uh, the kernel of this map, right? It is a finite index, of course, in GLNR, right? Is uh, called the congruence subgroup. In fact, the principal congruence subgroup of uh, level uh, at level alpha, all right? And uh, more generally, any uh, subgroup commensurable uh, with our uh, congruence subgroup, right? Uh, we can def we can define uh, the same thing, right? For any such subgroup, we have uh, we can intersect gamma with GL and uh, alpha, the congruence subgroup, and then uh, say that gamma of alpha is a congruence subgroup of gamma. And congruence, of, and congruence subgroup problem uh, asks the following. Does every normal subgroup N of finite index of gamma contain a suitable congruence subgroup for gamma alpha? So for, it means for, for some ideal whether it contains gamma alpha, right? And it is quite natural question, right? And uh, at the very first time when it was considered as I mentioned 19th century, all right, where Friedkin and Klein discovered that the answer is actually negative, that we have non congruent subgroups in SL2Z. And then uh, the problem is it was negative, since it was negative answer, it was sort of uh, uh, drop. Uh, the, the question uh, was uh, sort of uh, partially forgotten. And then it was resumed in uh, 60s of uh, 20th century when Bas, Lazar, and Ser and independently Menike showed that uh, the congruence subgroup uh, problem for SL and Z when N is greater or equal than three is actually a has affirmative answer. Right? So every uh, subgroup of finite index of SL and Z where N is greater or equal than three is a congruence subgroup. Right? And... Uh, where I'm going, right? And then uh, I just state general uh, uh, general definition of the congruence subgroup problem. In fact, congruence subgroup problem is stated for arithmetic groups. It can be stated for linear groups, but then it is a question of representation, not really of a, of a group itself, right? Because it might depend on the representation. For arithmetic group, it is uh, it doesn't depend on the representation, and I'm going to state it. So. If we have K, which is a global field, right? And then uh, G is algebraic group with all these definitions of K, we can uh, consider uh, the ring of S integers, right? Right of S integers, where S is uh, the uh, finite set of places containing all Archimedean places, right? So uh, then we uh, consider the uh, ring of S integers and we can take G of O, which is the group of S integral points, right? And then uh, an S arithmetic group uh, gamma is uh, a group commensurable with uh, G of O. Right? And then we can uh, define for every ideal, which is always a finite index in a such a ring, right? We can define uh, the uh, congruent subgroups in the same way as usually do, uh, right? We have gamma of alpha consists of all elements, right? Which are congruent to one model alpha, all right? For corresponding ideal, all right? And this, uh, these subgroups, they define a topology. If we take these subgroups as a fundamental system, congruent subgroup of fundamental system of one, in our arithmetic group, then uh, it defines congruence topology, so-called congruence topology. Right. And 
of course, I mean, if you take all subgroups of finite index of our arithmetic group, right, then uh, it defines uh, the profinite topology, which is stronger than congruence uh, uh, topology because every congruence subgroup is subgroup of finite index, but in principle, not uh, every subgroup of finite index is a congruence subgroup. All right. And then uh, uh, we uh, can make a completion, both completions. We can take a completion uh, with respect to the profinite topology, which is just inverse limit of finite quotient. And we can take uh, a completion with respect to congruence topology and call it congruence completion. All right. And then we will have two topological groups, in fact, two profinite groups. Right. And since the profinite topology is stronger than uh, the congruence topology, right, uh, we have natural epimorphism of uh, uh, continuous epimorphism of the profinite completion into the uh, congruence completion of our arithmetic group. And uh, the kernel of this uh, epimorphism is called uh, the congruence kernel. Right. And uh, all right, the congruence kernel. All right. And then uh, we can interpret actually the congruence subgroup problem in terms of the congruence kernel. The affirmative solution uh, to the congruence subgroup problem is equivalent of saying that our congruence kernel is trivial. And in fact, the size of our congruence kernel characterizes uh, the difference between the profinite and congruence topology. It is exactly the devi deviation from the positive solution of congruence subgroup problem. Right. So, uh, so uh, basically reformulate the congruence subgroup problem uh, saying, uh, well, uh, we can uh, ask well, to compute or to describe the congruence kernel when congruence kernel is infinite, right? right? And we will refer to this uh, as to uh, the complete solution of the congruence subgroup problem when we have full description of full uh, or computation of the congruence scan. Right? And uh, again, uh, Bass, Milner, and Sir, right, made complete solution of the congruence uh, subgroup problem for a cell n uh, where n greater or equal than three or SP2M n equal than two and greater or equal than two. All right, and namely the solution is the following. If S contains a non-complex place, that is the place such that KV is not equal to the complex numbers, all right, then the congruence uh, kernel is trivial and otherwise it is finite cyclic. In fact, it is, uh, it is a, a group of unity, uh, uh, consists of, of all roots of unity of uh, our field K. And then uh, Sir uh, investigated uh, the case of SL2, all right? And he uh, proved that uh, if uh, uh, the number of elevations, all right, um, uh, our S, all right, is uh, greater than one, then, uh, then uh, the description of the congruence kernel is exactly like uh, the paragraph before. So it is finite cyclic and contains of all units of unity. In, in and if S uh, equal to one, cardinality of S equal to one, namely if we have only one valuation, which is, then uh, C is uh, the congruence kernel is infinite, right? So from this point, uh, uh, I will come uh, to, uh, 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 to consideration of the uh, big uh, uh, conjecture of Sir, that it's still open, right? So uh, he conjectured the following, that if we have uh, algebraic group of, a, of, a, of a, glo a global field with all these definitions, all right, and S uh, is set of evaluation that contains all uh, non-Archimedean uh, evaluations, uh, then uh, rank, uh, if rank uh, G is greater or equal than two, all right, then the congruence kernel is finite. And if the rank of G is equal to one, then the congruence kernel is infinite, right? So uh, 
uh, this is a, a proper definition of the rank, right? And I will refer to this uh, just uh, case as a rank one case when this rank S of G equal to one. Right? And uh, the most general and uh, the uh, most striking result that I, I see in, in this problematic is uh, the result of Aragonathan, who proved the source conjecture uh, for general case when a rank SG is greater than one for isotropic groups. Right? Now, a self uh, proof that uh, the congruence uh, kernel is infinite for non-uniform arithmetic subgroups of SL2C. Right? And Lubotsky uh, proved uh, uh, it, uh, for co-contact lattices, right? And in the case of positive characteristics. So you, as you see, I already uh, entered uh, the topic when the congruence kernels is infinite. And, and now I want to uh, mention uh, the complete solution of the congruence subgroup problem for cell to z, uh, z uh, due to Melnikov who proved that uh, in this case, uh, the congruence kernel is completely described. It is free for finite group of countable rank. Right. So it is free object in the uh, free uh, in the category of profinite group, right? Free project, and uh, the rank of this free project, uh, uh, this free object is infinite. And this theorem was extended, uh, later extended by uh, the speaker, right, to all actually arithmetic subgroups of SL2R. Right. So, in the, uh, for the cases of SL2R, we have uh, the complete solution of the congruence subgroup problem. Right. Uh, and this gives evidence uh, that uh, in the one run cases, the congruence kernel should be very big. And the, uh, there is uh, uh, many support of this uh, evidence so that I uh, will talk later, right? But I, I want to mention the, the following uh, here, that even if as a subgroup, if, uh, as a group, the congruence kernel, even as a profinite group, right? The congruence kernel is very big. It is not so big as a normal sum. So in characteristic uh, zero, for example, there is a theorem for Lubotsky that says that C is finitely generated as a normal sum. And then there is a, a, a result of Prasad and Repinchuk, Andrei Repinchuk, right? That tells even more, right? What uh, it tells? Well, if you take uh, this, uh, uh, our arithmetic group, right? Uh, G of uh, uh, OS, right? Then actually we can extend uh, the profinite topology to uh, to our algebraic group G of K, and it doesn't uh, and make a completion step. But of course the profinite completion of G is not profinite group anymore. It is not profinite group anymore, right? But uh, when you restrict it to arithmetic subgroup, it is still our uh, profinite group, profinite completion of arithmetic group. And uh, Prasad and Repichuk proved uh, that. Uh, in uh, in uh, as a subgroup as, as a subgroup of our prof of, prof of the completion of uh, jihad of an algebraic group, our congruence kernel is almost uh, generated by one element. Right. So in that sense, that C mod uh, uh, mod uh, normal closure of an uh, one element is finite set. So it is sort of uh, shows that as a uh, as a profinite group a congruence kernel is big right but uh, as a normal cell group not so much right and uh, uh, the the results more showing that it is very big right is due to Lubotsky and Mason for uh, the ring of integers of imaginary quadratic field right so the uh, Lubotsky proved that SL2O contains free profinite group of countable rank. And Alec Mason showed that actually it can, uh, has a, a free profinite group of countable rank as a quotient. All right. And uh, one can deduce from uh, results of Henry Wilton and Speaker that the same is true actually for co-compact arithmetic subgroups of SL2C. 
So a ring of integers, uh, arithmetic subgroups uh, can have uh, can be uh, non-uniform and co-compact, right? And non-uniform are those which are commensurable with Bianchi groups, namely uh, those which are in uh, theorem uh, uh, above, right? And for co-compact case, right, uh, one also can deduce. And moreover, uh, there are a paper, uh, there is a paper uh, of uh, Fritz Gurinewald, Andrei Hank and mine where it is proved uh, that uh, uh, where it is deduced actually, right? Uh, uh, the, where it is proved that arithmetic subgroups um, are good in SL2C, right? And it uh, shows uh, uh, then, right, that uh, the homological dimension of the congruence kernel is uh, less or equal than two. So actually our, uh, a congruence kernel in 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 the case of SL2C, right? It can have cohomological dimension one or two, and we don't know up to now whether it is one or two. In fact, the reasonable question, right, whether congruence kernel is always uh, isomorphic to free of a group of countable runs. But for this, one has to decide uh, whether cohomological dimension is one, because if it is two, right, then it is not the case, all right? And uh, there are some connections uh, of uh, this question with uh, torsion of uh, of subgroups uh, of, uh, of subgroups of finite index of arithmetic subgroups uh, in SL2C, but I don't have time to uh, tell this, right? What I want to say is uh, what more we know about uh, congruence kernel in this case, right? So uh, it is a result of Henry Wilton and speaker that Actually, every finitely generated pro P subgroup of C is free pro P. Well, you see, pro finite groups, they have like finite groups, they have seal of theory, and therefore they have a seal of subgroups, right? And uh, of course, if we would, if we would know uh, this result for seal of subgroups of uh, the congruence kernel, right? Then we would know cohomological dimension. But uh, this theorem is only about finitely generated pro P subgroups of the congruence kernel. Nevertheless, so that it, 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 it is indication that actually the congruence kernel in this case might be free. Okay. Uh, that is already uh, here. Where I am. Oh. And, uh, well, uh, there is a result that I want to say, right, is that in fact this uh, result can be extended sort of to standard arithmetic subgroup of SL, uh, SON1. It is also subgroups. Uh, and it follows in a while. Uh, well, it follows from Berger and Hallen and Weiss that uh, standard arithmetic subgroups of SON1 namely those subgroups that come from quadratic forms, arithmetic subgroups, they are virtually special in the sense of what? So they have a sort of nice, uh, nice hierarchy. They have nice hierarchy and this hierarchy is sort of uh, closed in uh, profane topology. Uh, so from this one, it, it can extend, all right, uh, uh, the uh, facts about cohomological dimension using the same technique as uh, in uh, in my paper of Grunewald uh, with Andre Heiken, right? To deduce uh, that congruence kernel in this case is also has finite cohomological dimension. In fact, uh, cohomological dimension is less or equal than n minus one. So in this case, we also don't know whether cohomological dimension is actually one and minus one or something in between. So it is reasonable to ask, actually, what is the cohomological dimension of the, of the congruence kernel in this case, All right? But uh, uh, one can deduce from this result, right? Similar theorem about a uh, congruence kernel, namely that every finitely generated pro P subgroup of the congruence kernel C in this case is also free pro P, All right? So it is, again, indication that perhaps actually we always would have a free profinite group of countable run. 
Well, uh, in fact, I, I don't have any other evidence uh, for this, right? So I doubt that uh, uh, one can uh, affirm it with more strength than uh, this, but, uh, but one, one can ask the question, all right? So I would say the following, that one can ask the question, but it is too early to, uh, to put it as a conjecture. And I want to mention only uh, that uh, uh, if n is even, uh, then it, uh, this applies to all arithmetic subgroups of us, uh, as O and one, because all arithmetic uh, subgroups are standard in this case. And uh, now I want to finish with positive characteristic, all right? So I want to uh, mention uh, the result, which was obtained with Alec Mason, uh, Alexander Premit, uh, our uh, chairman of this session, Suri, and uh, the speaker. Namely, it described the congruence kernel when we have uh, when we have lattices of uh, arithmetic lattices uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the case of a local field. Right. So it says the following, uh, that if we have arithmetic, uh, uh, arithmetic letters, right, of algebraic uh, group of a local field in the positive characteristic, actually not obligatory uh, positive characteristic, but uh, I mean, the result really is uh, important for positive characteristic in this setting, right? Uh, right? Uh, that in this case, we have full uh solution complete solution of the congruence subgroup problem namely we have uh we have a, a description of this as a free profinite product right of free group of countable rank and elementary abelian pro p groups of uncountable rank. so in this case it, actually the congruence kernel even bigger than uh, in the case of uh characteristic zero because really we will have group here, elementary abelian uh, pro p groups of uncountable rank, two to the alif node. And we have free product. And you see, uh, one can uh, observe here that this full description says that the structure of the congruence kernel depends only on characteristics. So actually it doesn't depend on the field, right? It is only depends on the characteristic of the field, all right? And this is uh, really uh, by the by the time we uh, uh, obtained this result was surprised to us, right? Well, uh, this is uh, the last result I want to mention, but uh, uh, I want to uh, make some speculations about uh, this case. You see, in uh, several uh, years ago, it was a conference in on arithmetic groups in Banff. Uh, when I observed uh, during my talk uh, that actually congruence subgroup problem has a very negative solution. Uh, I mean, it means that congruence kernel is, when uh, congruence kernel is infinite, all right, uh, then uh, the, uh, the arith uh, arithmetic uh, group is good in the sense of set. What means good? Arithmetic, uh, actually the group is good if cohomology of our group coincide with cohomology of the profile completion. Right. And uh, in the paper I mentioned with Grunewald and Heiken, we even um, uh, make, made a conjecture, some sort of question that probably in all the cases when congruence kernel is infinite, right, the arithmetic group is good. And plus in that conference, I said that I observed that usually residual properties of the group, like conjugacy separability and subgroup separability, all right, is uh, are satisfied if the congruence uh, kernel is big. For example, uh, all arithmetic subgroup of SL2C, right, they actually uh, conjugacy separable and subgroup separable. And now, uh, uh, in this case, in the case of SLN1, right, the subgroup separability fails. So the congruence kernel is big, but subgroup separability fails at this result due to sum. But conjugacy separability and goodness stays, they prove that. So in this case, uh, conjugacy, uh, the group is conjugacy separable and good. 
arithmetic our arithmetic group all right so uh in this in this sense uh this uh, sort of question observation it stands also for uh, this group uh, sub arithmetic subgroups of so and one all right and uh i think uh i uh finish here all right and uh stop uh, uh for uh and open for the questions thank you professor raghunathan you wanted to ask something you are muted you are still muted i think Uh, you have any results for SU and one for standard arithmetic groups in SU and one? Standard, ah, it is those which are come come from quadratic form. If you have quadratic form, oh, right, this right. signature one, right? So n variables and like x x square x one square plus x two square plus etc. And then minus the last variable, and you take he, SO, right? right. He's asking All about right. SU and one. Yes, you. Yes, you is what I'm asking about unitary groups. Ah. Standard, standard unitary groups. Do you have any results on that? No, I don't know. It is. Uh, you see, it is uh, depends only on this Bergeron Hanwood Weiss result, which is geometric. That arithmetic subgroups has mm -hmm. very nice geometric structure. From this, right, mm -hmm. we can uh, we can uh, really. Uh, deduce that with, the, with respect to profinite completion, arithmetic structure of geometric structure of arithmetic groups, plus something like hierarchy of splitting, right? It's still preserved in the profinite completion. And therefore, uh, we can deduce something about the congruence kernel, right? If the structure, if you don't know the geometric structure of the subgroup, right, then uh, this method doesn't work. Uh, on the other hand, the natural map from the congruence kernel of SU and one to the congruence kernel of SU and one is often subjective. That might help get hold of something, help you get uh, hold of something of the structure of the SU and one case. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, well, yeah. maybe one has to think about this. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one question, Pavel, the, did you mention that you speculate uh, about SO and one, but is it always one or something, or did you say anything? Uh, what do you suspect? No, no, no. Uh, well, I don't know, actually. You see, the, this theorem that every finitely generated pro-P subgroup, right, is free, right, might suggest, right, uh, that uh, the congruence kernel, uh, in this case, even can be free pro, uh, free pro finite, right? But this is a, a very weak evidence mm. because finitely generated subgroups are, are really small, yes. right? In yes. this setting. Thank you. So, any other questions? Uh, Rahul or Shashank, is there any YouTube questions? Anybody has asked anything? The technical team? No, there is. There is no uh, question. Okay, so okay. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Professor Zaleski, for a nice lecture. And uh, we uh, I, I break now stop. for 10 minutes. And I should stop share screen. Right? Please uh, stop sharing. Yes. All right. Uh, I, I don't know. Wait. Sounds good. We'll be back in nine minutes. Oh. So there. Wait. Uh, I need to. That's not okay. Stop share. Right. Oh, right. It stops share and then I switch off my. So, Raghunathan, you said that congruence kernel from SO n1 to SU n1 is subjective. SU n1 hmm. is subjective, yeah. See, I'm not 100% I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm fairly certain that that must be true because. I, I've looked at it in a slightly different, wait a minute. In fact, yeah, in my paper with- Venki, uh, Venkatramana. Venkatramana, we proved that kind of statement, if I remember right, okay? Mm -hmm. From, see, where yeah. we prove, deal with Betty numbers, 
to the first better number there one of the key steps is to for proving it for us we want to prove it for us for in one knowing it for us in one from kashta and for that the trick is to embed s1 in one s1 in one and then show that the congruence can subjects on on the kernel of s1 in one something of that kind it's hmm. a long time ago so i'm not hard at person sure but i think we uh, have a proof of that paper all right so it it will suggest that actually uh, we will have a nice structure up to this kernel of this epimorphism that you uh, tell yeah, right? yeah that, that might help uh, understand yeah 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 Let's, let's, let's see. Yeah. No, is here? No, I don't. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't remember if we proved uh, surjective or uh, you know, it just generates the congruence group kernel of the smaller group, generates the congruence group kernel of the oh. bigger group. Okay, okay. Maybe we group yeah. normally generates. I'm not normally sure. Normally generates. Normally generates. Exactly. Normally yeah. generates. Yeah. So maybe. Uh, yeah. But even that could be have some. Yeah, yeah. That could that could yeah, yeah, yeah. something. That's right. Well, actually, yeah. I mean, since you mentioned it, it is uh, it is good to to look at this map exactly. Maybe there is more information about this surjective map, which yeah. can give to the structure of the congruence kernel. Yeah. Thank you, Pavel. Well, thank you for uh, for um, uh, organizing this right session. <laughs> Another five six next, minutes later, we'll meet. Yeah, next is Igor Arapinchuk, uh, as I understand. That's right. So, Igor, would you like to see whether you can share your screen? Sure. Well, let's try that. Yep. Yes. Okay. Is it okay? That's right. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Well, I'll stop share for now and then yes. <laughs> come back a, a few minutes before the start. Sure.
just about a minute left. Maybe I'll share my screen. Yes, please. Yeah. Is it okay? Perfect. Okay, so I guess it is uh, time now. Uh, once again, I would like to keep the introduction very short. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Igor Rapinchuk. Uh, Igor Rapinchuk is currently an assistant professor of mathematics at Michigan State University. He received his PhD in 2013 at Yale University under the supervision of uh, Margulis. Igor's research interests span several directions in algebra, a theory of algebraic groups, and arithmetic geometry, including structural properties of division algebras, as well as rigidity questions for non-arithmetic groups. Uh, in the study of rigidity, he introduced novel techniques that allowed him to resolve new cases of a long-standing conjecture of Borel and Tits, and also to obtain several applications for character varieties. Uh, the main focus of his current work is on finiteness properties of algebraic groups over higher dimensional fields, which is the subject of his talk today. The uh, precise title is Algebraic Groups in Good Reduction. Uh, over to Igor. Okay, hey, well, thank you very much for the introduction and a big thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak in this conference. It's really a big honor and pleasure to uh, be speaking here today. Okay, so let me get started. Okay, so, um, right, so as my uh, the title suggests, the topic of my talk today will be algebraic groups with good reduction. Now, for a little bit of context, so one of the main directions of my work over the past few years has been trying to develop various aspects of the arithmetic theory of algebraic groups over so-called higher dimensional fields. That is to say, function fields of algebraic varieties over various classes of base fields. And recently, a property that has come to the forefront as a kind of a unifying theme has been good reduction. Okay, so to get started, perhaps I should say precisely what I mean by good reduction in this context. Okay, so suppose we have a field K equipped with a discrete valuation V. And uh, suppose we're given a reductive algebraic group G defined over K. Then we say that G has good reduction at the discrete valuation V if there exists a reductive group scheme script G over the valuation ring of the completion, whose generic fiber is isomorphic to the base change of G up to the completion. And then an automatic consequence of this definition is that the special fiber or the reduction is a reductive algebraic group over the residue field of the same type as the initial group G. So basically what this definition is saying is that the condition of having good reduction basically means that our group has a nice integral structure over the valuation ring that behaves well under reduction by the, uh, the, by the maximal idea. Okay, so this is of course a somewhat abstract definition, but fortunately it turns out that in quite a number of situations of interest, it's possible to describe the condition of good reduction in fairly down-to-earth terms. Okay, so let me mention a few examples of that. Okay, so first of all, uh, one thing to note is that if G is a split group, then G has good reduction at any discrete valuation V. And the reason for that is that by the well-known Chevrolet construction, any split group actually arises from a group scheme over C. So it has good reduction, we can reduce it modulo basically anything we want. Here's another interesting example. Suppose we take a central simple algebra A over K and we consider the associated group SL1A. So that's the algebra group corresponding to the elements of reduced norm one in A. Then it turns out that this group uh, G has good reduction at V 
if and only if our algebra is unramified at V. That is to say, it arises from an, an Azamaya algebra over the valuation. Okay, so that's one nice uh, situation. Here's another nice situation where, again, good reduction can be described fairly concretely. So suppose that G is the spinner group of a non-degenerate quadratic form Q in N variables. Then one can show that this group has good reduction at V if and only if, up to scalars, our quadratic form is equivalent to quadratic form all of its coefficients are units in the valuation. Okay, so this is just to give you a, a somewhat of a flavor of what this condition of good reduction means. Now, before continuing, let me recall one more definition which will be relevant for us shortly. And that is the notion of a K-form of an algebraic group. So again, we fix our algebraic group G over K. And then we say that a, a group a G prime defined over K is a K-form of G if the two groups become isomorphic over a separable closure. Okay, so again, let me just mention um, a quick example. So if A is a central simple algebra of degree N over our field K, then it's well known that over the separable closure, our algebra becomes just a matrix algebra. And therefore the group SL1A, which we already encountered on the previous slide, is a K form of the group SL. Okay, so uh, now that I have briefly recalled the notion of good reduction, as well as uh, what we mean by a K form, let me now formulate a general problem that's at the focus, uh, that's the current focus of our work. Okay, so suppose we have a field K, which is equipped with a set V of discrete valuations, and we take a reductive algebraic group G defined over K. Then what we would like to understand are the K-forms of G that have good reduction at all places V in V. Okay, so this is of course a very general problem and it's obviously totally hopeless to try to solve it at this level of generality. So to make the question meaningful, one really needs to specialize the field K, uh, the set uh, V, and possibly also the group G. Okay. So that's the general problem. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so one case that has been uh, analyzed pretty extensively in the literature before is what I call, like to call the Dedekind case. So here we take K to be the fraction field of a Dedekind by ring R, and the set V consists of the discrete valuations associated with the maximal ideal of R. And uh, well, one of the first instances of this that occurs in the literature uh, is work by Harder from the 1960s. And also Kalyatilin and Sansu considered uh, this uh, sort of situation in the 1970s. Now the basic case where the ring R uh, uh, is just the ring of integers was analyzed extensively by De Gros in the 1990s. And there is also more recent follow-up work on this topic by Brian Kahn. Okay, so that's sort of the arithmetic situation. Now, another very interesting example, which fits into this general Dedekind framework, and which is of a more geometric flavor, uh, really goes back to a famous result of Raghunathan and Ramanathan. So more precisely here, we take R to be the ring of polynomials in one variable over a field level K. So then capital K is of course, just the uh, uh, field of rational functions in one variable. And we take V to be the set of discrete valuations associated with a monic irreducible polynomial. And so as far as good reduction goes, here's what, um, uh, so what this uh, result of Rakunathan and Ramanathan implies. So for simplicity, let's uh, assume that K is a field of characteristic zero and that G zero is a connected reductive algebraic group over little K. 
Okay, so then of course we can consider the base change of G0 up to the field of rational functions. And now suppose that G prime is a K form of this base change, which has good reduction at all places V and V. Then it turns out that G prime really just arises uh, from, as a base change of a K form of G0 of the base field little k. Okay, so in other words, we get a very nice description of forms with good reduction in this situation. Now, I should say that the original uh, theorem of Raghunathan and Ramanathan was actually stated in terms of torsors over the affine line, but it's actually fairly straightforward to deduce this, um, this statement from uh, the original result. Now, more recently, uh, Chernosov, Gilles, and Piancola considered a similar problem over what they call the punctured affine line. So uh, algebraically, they work over the ring of Laurent Panel. And so I believe that this will be the subject of Volodya's uh, talk, which is next on the schedule. So I won't really say anything more about that. Okay, so what I'd like to just, uh, the, the point that I'd like to make is that the Dedekind situation is really quite well understood um, uh, for the purposes of this problem. By contrast, until a few years ago, not much was really known about the higher dimensional situation. And so our work really takes some of the first steps in this interesting and quickly developing direction. Okay, so what is our setup? Well, we take G, uh, we take K to be a finely generated field. And then we consider models of our field K, which is to say we look at normal integral affine schemes over Z or FP, whose function field is this field K. And then to any such model, we can associate the, we can consider the associated divisorial uh, set of discrete valuations. That is to say the set of discrete valuations of K associated with the prime divisors on our model. Okay, so that's sort of the geometric uh, description of our setup. And really this is the point of view which is most useful in, in, in the majority of situations. Uh, but uh, if you prefer, one can describe the setup in purely algebraic terms as well. So namely, we take our field K and inside we consider a subring R whose fraction field is K with the condition that R is a finely generated algebra over Z or FP and R is integrally closed in K. And then the set V simply corresponds to the height one prime ideals of Okay, so that's what I mean by the higher dimensional situation. And now, what is sort of uh, the main conjecture that, um, uh, that our recent results suggest? Okay, so we take K again to be a finely generated field equipped with a divisorial set of places. And we take G to be a, a reductive uh, group over K. Then our main conjecture is that if the characteristic of our field is good, in a sense that I'll specify in just a second, then we expect that the set of isomorphism classes of K forms, G prime of G, which have good reduction of V and V is finite. And what do I mean by good characteristic? Well, uh, uh, so if G is an absolutely almost simple group, we say that the characteristic is good if it's either zero or if it does not divide the order of the valid group. And for tori, we just take uh, characteristic zero to be good. Okay, so um, our main conjecture predicts the finiteness of basically forms uh, having good reduction at all places V in our divisorial set. Okay. So uh, just uh, to mention in passing, I should point out that sort of philosophically, this conjecture has some similarities to the famous uh, Schaffer-Age conjecture for abelian uh, varieties with good reduction that was proved by Faltz. But of course, uh, this similarity is um, you know, really of a rather superficial nature. I mean, the techniques used in studying this conjecture are really quite different from what's used in the study of abelian varieties. 
Now, why do we refer to this as our main conjecture? Okay. Well, the point is that, um, as I already hinted at the start of my talk, uh, good reduction serves as a kind of unifying theme. And more precisely, what this main conjecture does is it brings together several strands in the quickly developing arithmetic theory of algebraic groups over higher dimensional fields. Okay, so let me just quickly mention some of these connections. So it turns out that the main conjecture has some pretty striking applications to the study of local global principles for algebraic groups. And I'll say a little more about this in the next subsection. Uh, it's also closely related to some uh, natural and actually extremely difficult uh, problems concerning finest properties of unramified cohomology. Uh, next, it comes up quite naturally in the analysis of algebraic groups having the same maximal tori, or in other words, what is now sometimes referred to as the genus problem. Uh, and another very striking application is that the main conjecture is closely connected to the analysis of weakly commensurable Zariski dense subgroups and applications to some classical problems on locally symmetric spaces. And the reason why this last application is re really rather striking is that um, basically, this is one of the uh, first ca uh, cases where techniques of, uh, of number theory and arithmetic geometry are you know, being used to you know, solve some longstanding problems in differential geometry. Okay, so that's just to give you an idea of all the relations of the main conjecture to various other problems of interest. Now, uh, in the interest of time, I'll focus only on the connection with local global principles. Okay, so let me say a little bit about that. Okay, so first, let me just briefly recall the general setup and the cohomological approach to local global principles. And then I will say more about you know, how our conjecture fits into this picture. Okay, so the general setup is like this. Uh, we take a field uh, K, which is equipped with a set of uh, evaluations, which you know, are often discrete, but don't have to be. And we take G to be an algebraic group over K. So then one can consider the global to local map in Galois cohomology. And then one says that the Hasse principle holds if this map is injected. And another useful object that one encounters in this, uh, in this uh, field is the tate shafrerich set, which by definition is the kernel of this global to local map. Now, the situation which was a study classically was when our field is a number field and V is the set of all places of K. And then one of the really the pinnacles of, uh, of the classical arithmetic theory of algebraic groups is that the Hasse principle holds if G is a simply connected or adjoint. On the other hand, it is known that for arbitrary algebraic groups, the map may fail to be injective. But nevertheless, it is known that this map is always proper. That is to say, the preimage of a finite set is always fine. So in particular, the tate shafer set is finite in this situation. Now, what our recent results suggest is that this properness property should hold in the vastly more general setting of finally generated fields. Okay, so more precisely, uh, suppose that K is a finally generated field equipped with a divisorial set of places K of, of K. So then what we predict is that if G is a reductive algebraic group over K, then the global to local map is always proper. In particular, this would imply that the tate shafferage set is fine. 
Okay, so in the next uh, subsection, I will mention uh, some results that we've obtained on both the main conjecture and this properness conjecture. But to conclude this subsection, let me uh, mention the promise connection between you know, uh, local global principles, specifically this properness conjecture and our main conjecture. And the connection looks like this. So suppose that the main conjecture holds for an absolutely almost simple, simply connected uh, group G over K and all divisorial uh, sets of places K. So let me just recall very briefly that the main conjecture predicts that we have basically fine and many forms that have good reduction at our uh, set B. Okay, so assuming that the main conjecture holds for the simply connected group, then it turns out that the global to local map is proper for the corresponding adjoint group and any divisorial set. So in other words, the point is that the main conjecture provides a uniform approach to our properness conjecture for adjoint. So that's uh, one of the connections of the main conjecture. And now to finish up, let me uh, briefly mention uh, several results that we've obtained on both the main conjecture and the properties. And I will start with the case of algebraic tori due to the fact that we've uh, managed to resolve both conjectures uh, 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 for this class of algebraic groups. Okay, so what is the precise statement concerning the main conjecture? Well, suppose that K is a finely generated field of characteristic zero and V is a divisorial set of places of K. Then what we show is that for any integer D greater than or equal to one, the set of K isomorphism class of D dimensional K tori, which have good reduction at all D and V is finite. Okay, so that establishes uh, the, the, main, uh, the main conjecture in the setting. Now, notice that here I assume that the characteristic of our field is zero. Well, we actually also have a similar statement in positive characteristic, provided that we restrict ourselves only to those tori which split over an extension of, a, of degree prime to p, where p is the characteristic of the field. So there again, for such tori, we have a finest statement uh, for, um, for uh, d dimensional tori having good reduction in all places b. Okay, so that uh, takes care of the main conjecture. What about the properness conjecture? Well, here we actually work in a somewhat more general setting. Namely, we consider not just uh, algebraic tori, but possibly disconnected um, algebraic groups whose connected component is a torus. So the precise result looks like this. Suppose that K is a finite generated field and V is a divisorial set of places. And let me uh, just emphasize that here, we do not impose any restrictions on the characteristic of our field. Then what we show is that for any algebraic group D over K, whose connected component is a torus, the global to local map is proper. So in particular, this implies that if we take um, our group to be a torus, then the tate shafarevich group is Now, one of the classical facts of, well, basically class field theory is that, is that the tate age group for a torus over a number field um, is finite. And uh, this, uh, this uh, proof relies on uh, tate nakayama duality and various other considerations of class field theory, which are not available in the general setting of finely generated fields. Okay, so to prove our result, we actually have two approaches. For uh, tori, one can argue using absolute purity as proved by Garber, but here one needs to impose some minor restrictions on the characteristic of our field. 
Uh, and to handle the general case, so specifically the case where, you know, our group is not necessarily just the torus, but a group whose connected component is a torus, we develop some adelic models. And the interesting thing is that the second approach shows that the finiteness of THF energy group for Torah over number fields can be deduced from, you know, two classical results in algebraic number theory, namely the finiteness of the class number and the finite generation of the group of units. Okay. So, I mean, I should say that the uh, uh, approach using class field theory, of course, gives more information, actually it describes the structure of the THF average group. But if one is interested in, in establishing only the fineness, then the full strength of class field theory is known. Okay, so uh, that takes care of algebraic tori. And now just to finish up, let me quickly mention some results for semi-simple groups. And I should say that by contrast with the case of algebraic tori, here, uh, there are still uh, quite a few um, open problems. But in any case, we've managed to uh, resolve the main conjecture in a number of cases. So for instance, for inner forms of type EN over arbitrary finite generated fields, uh, then uh, for spinner groups over so-called two-dimensional global fields, that is to say function fields uh, of curves over number fields and surfaces over finite fields, as well as function fields of rational surfaces. Also several cases of groups of type G2. And for the properness conjecture, uh, well, um, we get uh, the, uh, the, the properness of the global to local map for PSL1A over arbitrary finite generated fields, uh, quite a number of cases over two dimensional global fields, and also several cases for groups of type G2. But as I said, um, no. uh, whereas the our understanding is pretty much complete in the case of algebraic tori, here there remains uh, quite a lot of work to do, although there is already quite considerable progress. Okay, so uh, my overview of the results was uh, a little uh, fast, but um, I should say that if you're interested in, um, in looking at these questions um, in a little more detail, um, and uh, you know, seeing what has been done and various um, you know, open problems, I can suggest um, our, our recent article in the notices of, of the AMS and also our uh, more extended uh, uh, survey on this uh, topic, which is item seven on this, on this list of references. Okay, so I think I will stop here. Thank you, Igor, thank you. So questions, please. Anybody has questions, you could ask. Unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I have a book here. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, applications to cohomological finiteness properties in the unramified case, and I see it's reference number four. Uh, so could you say a little bit about what that was hinting at? Uh, yeah, so the application, so, okay, so for instance, let me go back um, to this slide. So I say we resolve the main conjecture for uh, spinner groups over two-dimensional global fields. So I remember this is uh, saying that we have finitely many forms with good reduction. And the point is that using Milner's conjecture on quadratic forms, uh, we basically reduce this, um, this statement to a certain fineness statement for unramified cohomology. That is to say, we need unramified um, you know, Gawa cohomology with respect to our set of discrete valuations to be finite in all degrees. So that's the, that's the, the, uh, the connection that I was hinting at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So. Some other questions? I had a small question with, uh, can you say something about uh, applications to the genus problem you mentioned? Uh, yeah, so uh, the application to the genus problem uh, basically, um, well, it relies on the following statement, which is, um, 
basically, you know, we, we consider our, um, our group G and we assume that our group has good reduction at a place V. Then under some uh, uh, hypotheses, we show that any group in the genus of G, that is to say any group which has the same maximal tori also has good reduction at V. And then using our uh, main conjecture, so, so assuming that we have only finely many forms with good reduction, this would imply the fineness of the genus. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, let's thank Igor and uh, uh, we'll have another 10 minutes for the next talk. Thank you, Igor. You can stop thank sharing. You. We have another 10 minutes. Uh, hello, Vladimir. Uh, how are you? Oh, hi, sir. I'm fine, thank you. And hope I hope you are okay. Also, everything is going smoothly. That's great. Right. I think uh, things are becoming uh, better. Can I start to try to share screen? Uh, yes. Why don't you try? Uh, okay. I hope you can see. Right. Yes. Is it a full screen? Uh, uh, just let me try a uh, read mode. Mm. Yeah, that is fine. Okay, great. Mm. If you want, you can stop sharing and start again. Yeah, sure. What is the time there now? Uh, eight in the morning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I couldn't join during first session because it was deep night in Edmonton. <laughs> I just <laughs> joined only for last three talks. Mm. Sorry for that, but I can do nothing with the time difference. I think there is on the YouTube, we can see those uh, talks also. All right. Mm. Great. So we'll get back in another uh, few minutes, five minutes. Okay, so we'll start at 20 minutes, right? Uh, no, uh, another seven minutes for that. So. Seven minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. 
what I meant is in Edmonton, it will be 820, right? In, in India, it probably 920 or no, 720. It's, it's, it's less than 12 hours now. It's 7.50 p.m. Okay, okay. <laughs> 11 and a half, I guess. Yeah. I wish this conference uh, would be during different time without COVID, when we could yes. travel and to yes, meet in do. person. So it would next be time more, in India, you could come and again. It would be much more exciting.
Okay, it is time. Uh, let's just wait for for a second. Yeah, Professor Raghunathan is here. Hmm. Ah, I think Professor Raghunathan is here also. So it's a pleasure. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Vladimir Chernozov. Uh, Vladimir Chernozov is a professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. His research interests include variety of topics. Exceptional groups, non associative of structures, Lie algebras, R equivalents, Galois cohomology of linear algebraic groups, and the Hasse principle. Uh, he wanted me to keep the introduction very short, but I did have to say a few things. So he'll speak on, on conjugacy of Cartan subalgebras in extended affine Lie algebras and classification of torsos over Laurent polynomial rings. Over to Professor Chenazov. The floor is yours. Okay. Okay, so, so uh, I will try to share my screen first. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, uh, it is an honor to be a speaker on this uh, great conference. And to start with, I wish uh, happy birthday to Professor Raghunathan and I wish him all the best. Raghunathan made important contributions to different areas of mathematics, such as Lie theory, lattices, arithmetics of algebraic groups, number theory, and structure theory of algebraic groups over uh, general fields. I am not an expert on arithmetics, and I can't make uh, many comments on his work in arithmetics, but I acknowledge his deep contributions to the structure theory of algebraic groups. Among my favorite papers of Raghunathan is his joint work with Ramanathan on torsors on a fine line, and his following papers on torsors on the fine spaces and Grotendieck-Serre conjecture, this is the constant case. His papers on torsors on the point line is very deep and influential. It was used by many people in different areas, such as uh, in area related to purity conjecture, Grotendieck-Serre conjecture, norm principle for R equivalence, and so on and so on. I recently used it in my joint work on uh, in a paper when we proved uh, Weistitz conjecture on U operators and many other things. So to uh, give you, uh, to make a bridge between his talk on torsors on the point line at my talk today, I want to mention that if you read carefully his uh, proof uh, that every torsor on the point uh, line is constant, you will realize that the main idea is to prove that uh, when you twist uh, your group with your torsor, the uh, group scheme which you get contains a maximal torus. Once you do this, then the rest is very uh, formal and it's not difficult. Since then, his idea that the maximal tori can determine the structure of uh, algebra group or group scheme, which you consider, uh, uh, since then this idea sits deeply in my head and it was the key uh, point into my recent talks in my recent uh, projects uh, related to algebraic groups. First uh, project was about groups with good reduction. Igor Pinchuk delivered a talk about this uh, project. It's not finished yet. And the second project was related to conjugacy of Cartan subalgebras. And uh, this project is done. And I'm happy to uh, make a report about this project. This is a joint work with my collaborators and friends, Philippe Gilles, Erhard Neer, Arturo Pianzola, and Vladimir Yegorov. So let me start by introducing uh, terminology. In my talk, little k is a uh, base field of characteristic zero, not necessarily algebraically closed. And let me introduce the main object is the Cartan subalgebra. Let's consider a Lie algebra G over K 
a subalgebra H is called maximal adjoint diagonalizable mat or just simply Cartan subalgebra if it has two properties. It's diagonalizable with respect to the adjoint representation and it's maximal with respect to this property. So this is uh, the main object in my talk today, Cartan subalgebras in uh, Lie algebras. Mostly only algebras will be fine at infinite dimensional. And uh, let me say that uh, two Cartan subalgebras are conjugate if there is an automorphism of Lie algebra, which takes H1 into H2. And the main question in my talk is the following one. When are two Cartan subalgebras conjugate? <clears throat> Of course, you cannot expect that this is true in full generality for arbitrarily algebras, but uh, the intuition is that in the uh, most interesting cases, it uh, every two Cartan subalgebras should be conjugate. Let me consider two examples. So, example one, we uh, consider. Uh, a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra over an algebraically closed field K, and then all Cartan subalgebras are conjugate. This is a theorem due to Chevalier, and uh, it was used uh, in many, many uh, work uh, of many people. So just for terminology, I will say that G has nullity one, and I will justify this terminology uh, later. And uh, second remark that Chevalier theorem uh, shows that the root system, which we can attach uh, to simply algebra with respect to Cartan subalgebra, is a uh, invariant of uh, your Lie algebra. So again, uh, once you have a Cartan subalgebra, you can consider on the weights of a joint representation and uh, the weights have an additional structure, group uh, root uh, system structure. And this uh, root system structure is not variant. So second example, I will consider a fine cut smoothly algebras and I will be consider only split case and uh, this Lie algebras are given by uh, generators and relations with the use of generalized Cartan subalgebra. But instead of giving the definition, let me show you a realization of this affine Lie algebras, how they look like. You start uh, from Lie algebra G, like in our previous example, it's uh, simple, finite dimensional Lie algebra over an algebraically closed field K. So we consider the Laurent polynomial ring R in one variable. R is a K and variable T, T plus minus one. We take the following uh, vector space. It consists of three pieces. First piece, we take G and we take base extension. We consider Lie algebra G over Laurent polynomial ring. Then you have in the middle uh, two vectors, uh, spaces of dimension one uh, with generators C and D. C is a central element and D is a degree derivation. So let me mention that in G view at over R, you have a natural gradient uh, which is related to polynomial uh, variable T. And degree derivation in your Lie algebra acts uh, with, by using this formula. So it determines the structure uh, Lie algebra. And I want to mention that G over R view it inside L hat is not subalgebra. The Lie product is given by this formula. So it's almost Lie subalgebra, but it has additional central component C. Here, uh, xy is a, a killing form, and uh, you have a Kronecker delta, which is involved. So again, your first piece, g over r, is not Lie subalgebra in L hat. So this is the realization of a fine cut smoothly algebras. And uh, let me make a 
trivial remark that L hat uh, view it over k is infinite dimensionally algebra. This is clear. Uh, and but uh, L, which is uh, G over R, can be viewed in both ways, either over k or over R. Over k, it has infinite dimension, but over R, it has finite time. And in this case, we say that L hat has nullity one. I will justify terminology later. Now, let me give you an idea what is a Cartan subalgebra in this case. So we start from Cartan subalgebra in G, it's finite dimension. Let me denote it by H. And we consider the following uh, capital H, the subset inside L hat. It's a Cartan subalgebra in G and plus a central component and plus uh, the derivation part. And one can see that this is Cartan subalgebra in L hat. And uh, all Cartan subalgebras up to conjugates are exactly capital H. And this is the famous theorem due to Gus Peterson that all Cartan subalgebras are conjugate. So with uh, respect to our subalgebra H, uh, we have a root uh, roots. Uh, so we consider uh, weights of the joint representation and weights have a structure they call extended uh, affine root system. And uh, roots which appear are two types anisotropic or isotropic. Uh, I do not want to go into uh, definition of this uh, uh, notions, but let me just say that terminology comes from computing the lengths of roots. So there are two types of roots, anisotropic and isotropic. If you consider uh, the subalgebra generated by anisotropic roots, so in our example, you have a subalgebra uh, L plus KC and L is a hourly algebra G, which is finite dimensional, but view it over R. So this subalgebra is called the core. It's an ideal in hourly algebra. And uh, the way to recover L is a, a subalgebra this uh, subalgebra is the following. You take the core L hat and uh, take the quotient mod the center and it's called the centrally score. So you have the following diagram, typical diagram. You have L hat, your Lie algebra you start with. Inside you have uh, the core, which is subalgebra generated by anisotropic roots. And mod out modulo center, you have the Lie algebra L. And L can be viewed in both ways. Uh, if you view it over K, it's uh, infinite dimension, but as now you can view L over the uh, Laurent polynomial ring and it has finite time. So this is our two example. And now uh, I pass to the main, uh, li, uh, uh, example of Lie algebras, which I will consider today, these are called extended defined Lie algebras. Then can be sought as multivariable generalization of finite dimensional Lie algebras. And uh, how can we generalize uh, a fine cosmodial algebras? Again, they are given by generators and relations, but from the realization you can see that uh, it, First way to generalize, you can consider instead of uh, Laurent polynomial in one variables, uh, you can uh, take n variables. You can consider Laurent polynomials in n variables. And uh, in the realization of a fine cosmodial algebra, you can replace first piece, which was G over R, instead of Y, you can take n variables. So what you get, of course, you can uh, increase the central part, you have increased derivation part, and what you get at the end, it will be toroidal Lie algebras, which is also important in the literature. But uh, also you can uh, go into more uh, deep uh, 
generalization, instead of considering split Li algebra, you can consider uh, non necessary split, isotropic or anisotropic Li algebras. And uh, uh, so there is a way to generalize more uh, this example. And uh, what you get at the end of the day, you have an arbitrary nullity n. And uh, let me uh, give a brief an idea what is an extended a finely algebra. So what people did, I'm not expert in this area, but what people did is they just fix uh, the main properties of the fine uh, class uh, moduli algebras, which you want to get in general uh, case, and they came up to the following definition. So an extended finely algebra uh, uh, is a trip, triple. E, this is Lie algebra, H subalgebra, and you have invariant by linear uh, symmetric form on E. And this triple must satisfy five axioms. So the most important axioms is the following. H is a Cartan subalgebra. This is what you really want. And a second uh, important axiom is the following. If you consider weights of the joint representation, that the weights have a structure for extended defined root system. So this is what you want. And uh, there are some more properties which are not important from my talk today. And important fact is the following. Like for cuts moduli algebras, uh, there are two types of roads, anisotropic and isotropic. An important fact is that uh, when you consider the subspace generated by anisotropic roads, the subspace is an ideal and it's called the core of the algebra E. And uh, it contains the center. And uh, the quotient, uh, the core mod centra is called the centralist core. Okay, so from the construction, you have the same diagram like for a fine Cosmodili algebra. You start from the algebra E, inside you have an ideal which is called the core, and modulo the centra, you have the centralist core. So this is the key diagram in uh, what follows. So now I want to justify the terminolo uh, terminology, uh, the nullity of Lie algebra. And this is related to the following uh, property. We consider the centroid of the uh, centralist core. It consists of whole linear transformations which commute with uh, adjoint operators. So this formula three, uh, two equalities is a, uh, we say that uh, eta commutes with a, a joint representation. So it's called the centroid. It's in a notion uh, related to the Lie algebra ECC. And the amazing fact that in our situation, the centroid is uh, precisely the Laurent polynomial ring in n variables. And this is why I said that this is nullity n. If n is zero, one can show that the Lie algebra E is a precisely uh, Lie algebra from our first example. This is finite dimensional, simple Lie algebra considered by Chevalier. So this is the case n is equal zero. If n is one, one can show that your Lie algebra E is a precisely a fine Cosmodi Lie algebra. This is nullity one case. And now I'm uh, talking about arbitrary case, arbitrary nullity, and this is generalization of the fine Cosmodi Lie algebras. So there are two possibilities for the centralist core. We, uh, of course, centroid by the definition uh, acts on ECC, and you can consider ECC as a module over Rn. So, view it over Rn, it is of finite type or infinite type. There are two possibilities, and all of them must be started. 
if uh, the, cent uh, the centralist core uh, has infinite type over the centroid, then what you get is called the quantum torus in the literature. So I do not consider quantum torus uh, today. It's a different topic, but today I will consider only the case when uh, the centralist core has finite type. And the amazing fact that ECC is a twisted form of a split cent, uh, finite dimensional uh, Lie algebra G0. So you start from G0, which is split finite dimensional simple Lie algebra over K. This is uh, the setting example one. Then you take base change, you consider over Laurent polynomial in N variables. And ECC is a precisely twisted form of this Lie algebra. And uh, you have uh, the results, the following final theorem that all Cartan sub algebras in an extended finely algebras are conjugate. So the proof is very long, is difficult. And let me uh, tell you about uh, something about strategy of the proof of conjugacy. So the idea is the following. Uh, uh, you want to uh, reduce everything first to the centralist core. You want to first prove the conjugacy of Cartan subalgebra in the um, centralist core case, and then you want to lift. So, formally speaking, you have a first step. We start from two Cartan subalgebras, H1, H2 in E, then you take the uh, intersection with the core. What you get, you get uh, Lie subalgebras in the core, and you need to prove that both of them are Cartan subalgebras in EC. It's not a trivial fact, it's not automatical, you need to do something. So, uh, so first step, you go down to EC, the central score. Second step, you go down deeper, you go to the centralist core and you can see the images of your Cartan subalgebras and you need to prove that Cartan subalgebras uh, in the, uh, uh, which you get uh, are Cartan subalgebras in the centralist core. Next step, you need to prove that uh, what you get downstairs, you get Cartan subalgebras which are conjugate and the last step, you need to lift. You need to lift conjugacy from the centralist core to the algebra E. So the most difficult step here is step three. Uh, you, uh, the conjugacy of Cartan subalgebras in ECC uh, is a really very difficult fact. And uh, I want to explain what we, uh, we did in this case. So as I mentioned, uh, that the centralist core is a twisted form of split Lie algebra. And uh, over K, it's infinite dimensional, but over R, it has finite type. It's a free module over R. And our idea to prove the conjugacy of uh, Cartan subalgebras uh, view it over K and we somehow want to pass to R, we want to pass to a finite dimensional world and uh, to start the conjugacy in the finite dimensional case. So uh, recall that a characteristic is zero, this is uh, crucial, but a field is not necessarily algebraically closed. And now I want to uh, get a bridge which connects infinite dimensional world with finite dimensional. And for that, I consider the automorphism group of your Lie algebra ECC, view it over R, and it will be reductive, a reductive uh, adjoint group over R. So this is a group scheme over R. This is good. And the proof first step is the following a theorem. There is a one-to-one -one canonical correspondence between the set of Cartan subalgebras in Yoli algebra G. This is uh, 
centrally score and the set of maximal split tori in your reductive group scheme G. Under this correspondence, the conjugacy of two Cartan subalgebras, H1, H2, holds if and only if it holds for the corresponding uh, maximal split tori, T1, T2. So if by chance uh, your group scheme G would be defined over the field, then we're done because it's a famous uh, deep result that maximal split to right in algebraic groups over fields are conjugate. This is a known fact, but the difficulty is that your objects are defined over the ring R, not over the field. And you have to address to the question of conjugacy of maximal split to right. So uh, there is a, form, a formalism how to determine if two maximal two split to right conjugate or not. So you need to consider the centralizers in your group scheme G. Let me call H1 and H2. These are not Cartan subalgebra. These are uh, reductive group schemes. And there is a formally, uh, Uh, they have uh, one uh, great fact. H1, H2 contain maximal tori, not split, but maximal tori. And we will say that H1 and H2 are toral group schemes. Again, by toral group scheme, I mean a group scheme which contains a maximal torus. It's not the case that for arbitrary reductive group uh, G uh, defined to an arbitrary ring R, it contains a maximal torus. Th this is in general not true. So uh, for that reason, uh, we uh, determine a subclass which we call the toral group schemes. So there is a formal obstacle uh, uh, the same terminology we can uh, use uh, when we deal with uh, 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 with uh, H1, with uh, uh, H1. We say that co-cycle or uh, conjug uh, cohomological class C is called toral if the twisted group scheme contains a maximal torus. Uh, there is a formal obstacle for conjugacy and obstacle leaves in the uh, H1 with coefficients in the normalizer of T1. Normalizer is not connected, but in our situation, we can show that obstacle uh, leaves in the centralizer, not in the normalizer. So uh, assume you have an obstacle I denoted by eta. So it lives in the centralizer. Centralizer is a, a reductive group scheme. And abusing notation, I will denote this uh, centralizer by a G. This is a reductive group scheme over R. And you have a torsor or you have cohomological class. And you want to determine if it's trivial or not. Uh, so the main idea is again to pass to the quotient field. You have the pure transcendental extension of small k. If you pass to kn, the obstacle dies. As I said, that over fields, two maximal split to i are conjugate. So obstacle dies. So your obstacle leaves in the uh, kernel of the natural map. Uh, torsors over R, you go to torsors of a generic point and your obstacle lives in the kernel and you want to study this kernel. Uh, so uh, uh, we have this following classification in general case uh, of all uh, torsors over Laurent polynomial rings in N variables. So instead of considering the field of question, uh, question Kn, we pass deeper, we go to uh, completion. So consider the field Fn, which is uh, power series over T1, T2, Tn. So you fix the order of your variables, you consider uh, completions, 
and uh, you can see the in standard map, the nonical map from torsors over R to call the torsors over Fn. And you have the following facts about uh, this map uh, five. First, uh, five is subjective map. So this is also a big piece of information. Why it provides a lot of information? Because torsors over complete uh, discrete valuations fields are described in the Briotti theory. So you know a lot about of torsors over FM. Secondly, each fiber, uh, each fiber uh, of your map five contains a unique toral class. Again, class is called toral if uh, the twisted group scheme contains a maximal torus. Fiber contains a unique toral class. And in fact, that all elements in the fiber are in one-to-one -one correspondence of the uh, torsors and the risky topology of the twisted group scheme uh, uh, G twisted by uh, toral uh, class E psi. So this is a complete description of torsors over Laurent uh, polynomial rings and uh, it, it, it really provides us with a uh, proof of conjugacy of maximal uh, split uh, toral in your group scheme. Remember, you had an obstacle eater in H1 R over G. Eta dies over Fn. It dies when you pass to Fn. But it is a toral class, and the fiber contains a unique uh, toral class. So it out of necessity must be trivial. So this really, the theorem really completes the proof of conjugacy of maximal split toral in our situation, and it completes the proof of uh, conjugacy of Cartan subalgebras in uh, extended to finally algebras in the centralist uh, core case, and then what is left to leave the conjugacy from downstairs to upstairs. So uh, let me make one more uh, remark about the fibers of this map five. In our paper on uh, classification of uh, uh, H1 over Laurent polynomial rings, we made a conjecture that the fiber consists of a unique uh, element in the case when the twisted group scheme is isotropic in strong case. So this is very similar to the situation which Raghunathan considered in, in his work about torsors of fine spaces. The picture is completely similar. And we made a remark if the twisted uh, group scheme is isotropic, then the fiber consists of a unique element and this conjecture was proved recently by Stavrova, and uh, she proved really that if the fiber is isotropic in strong sense, uh, then uh, the fiber consists of a unique element. So my time is over. I wanted uh, to consider some one example that our classification of uh, 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 Torsor so we found uh, over Laurent polynomial rings is not formal. In uh, many situations, we can really uh, uh, give a very precise uh, construction uh, of this uh, torsors, but uh, let me stop. My time is over and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Are there any questions? I think there was a question on chat, but I think you answered it during your talk. Nevertheless, let me read it out. Uh, somebody asked, in general, nullity refers to dimension of something going to zero. But in this case, it refers to the number of vari variables in R. Is there some underlying meaning in this? Oh, oh 
there is no any deep meaning. It's just terminology. So you, you consider, for instance, simple finite dimensional Lie algebra. It's defined over the field K. There are no variables involved. There are no variables involved. And we say that this is nullity zero case. But mm -hmm. again, nullity can be uh, defined uh, in, in uh, uh, as an inner structure, so you need to consider the centroid attached to your Lie algebra. And in all examples which uh, we consider in all literature, the centroid is a Laurent polynomial ring. In case of simple Lie algebras, uh, centroid consists of K, no variables involved. And for that reason, we say that it's nullity zero. There is no deep connection with, with whatever, it's just terminology. Said Azam makes a remark that nullity is just the dimension of the radical of the form. So, is the dimension okay. of what? The radical of the form. Uh, what is the radical of the form? The form of what? Lie algebra or what? I guess the killing form, yeah. Ah, killing form? Oh, no. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, killing form is non degenerate, is non degenerate. So it has no rank. So there is nothing to do with the rank of killing form. Okay, thank you. I had a question. This uh, first step of the proof is it true that for the, the Cartan sub algebras of uh, the core always arises as an intersection? Or is this not true? You said intersection gives with the core gives the Cartan sub algebra uh, for the all core. Right. Mm. All right, but it, it's not automatic effect. Uh, it needs the proof, and the proof is not short. It's uh, maybe five pages, something like that. So, but still, uh, you need to prove. So, mm. you take restriction to the core, you need to prove what you get a, a Cartan sub algebra. They are clearly uh, diagonalizable with respect to joint representation, but you need to prove that they are maximal uh, diagonalizable. This is non-simple fact. And more difficult fact, when you go to the, uh, the centrally score, you still have a carton sub algebra. So everything needs to justify. I see, thank you. One final uh, question actually is, I would ask Syed Azam to please unmute yourself and ask, uh, make your comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, when we define the extended affine root system, I mean, this is defined by Saito. Uh, then the form in the the form is positive semi-definite, and the dimension of the radical of the form is just the nullity of the root system, which is also the null the nullity of the Lie algebra. Yes, that's true. Nullity can be restored if you know how this generalized root system looks like. This is precisely the nullity of the root system. You're right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, any other questions? Any questions on YouTube? Uh, no, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. And it's a pleasure to thank uh, uh, Vladimir Chernozov and also all the other two speakers of this second session. Um, so today's uh, session is over. I'll just hand it over to the technical team in case they want to make any announcements. Soumya, anything is there for any announcement for tomorrow? Um, hmm. Yeah, maybe the schedule is there in the website. And... Uh, Please have a look at the schedule now and uh, can yeah. join tomorrow. Thank you very much. So see you all tomorrow.